Good morning, it's Sheila. Good morning, Supervisor Kuehl. We can hear you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. This is a sound check. Commander Sergio Aloma, can you hear me? I can. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Mr. Mark Harris, can you hear me? Mr. Mark Harris? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Today is Tuesday, April the 6th, 2021. Our meeting today is being held remotely due to the current public health crisis to protect the health of all. I will now take roll call to confirm attendance. Please unmute your mic and respond when your name is called. Supervisor Mitchell? Present. Supervisor Kuehl? Here. Supervisor Hahn? Present. Supervisor Barker? Here. Great. Bezia Davenport, Chief Executive Officer? Present. Rodrigo Castro Silva, County Council? Here. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board? Here. As indicated on the posted agenda, we'll be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. The Executive Office of the Board received over 1,048 written public comments for today's meeting. And as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act's requirements. We'll continue to receive written public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Madam Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, set matter, 1030 a.m. Item S1 is a discussion of the public health order related to COVID-19. This item will be held for discussion. On page three, special district agenda. This is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. On page four, consent calendar, board of supervisors, items one through 20. On item five, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. This includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 12, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On page 15, administrative matters, items 21 through 57. On item 21, the Chief Executive Officer requests that this item be continued to June 22, 2021. 
On item 42, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On page 34, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting as indicated on the supplemental agenda. The request for continuances or items to be referred back through 55E are before you. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve these items, that will be the order. On page 35, ordinance for introduction. Item 58, this item relates to item 32. On page 36, notices for closed session. On page 39, items continue from previous meetings for further discussion and action by the board. On item A7, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be held to discuss and consider actions taken by the federal government related to immigration policies. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We'll now take public comments for all agenda items. Madam Executive Officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. To repeat, please call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. Do not call the number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 and follow the instructions. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which agenda items you wish to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will allocate up to 60 minutes for public comment on all of the items, um, including the public hearing item. If there are no speakers waiting before 60 minutes have lapsed, we will close public comment. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on the topic, or if we, not can, or if we cannot tell you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speakerphone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please? As a reminder, to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press 1 then 0 at this time. Do not press 1 then 0 a second time or you will be removed from the queue. Gustavo Herrera, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, Gustavo Herrera, item 17. Please begin. Good morning, Chairwoman Solis and members of the board. Happy Arts Month. My name is Gustavo Herrera, Director of Arts for LA. We represent a network of 70,000 arts advocates and 150 arts and cultural organizations. I'm here today to urge you to vote yes on item 17, which proclaims April as Arts Month and will begin the expansion of the Community Impact Arts Grants Program, CIAG. CIAG is vital to advancing cultural equity across the region. Investing in this partnership between the county and over 40 community-based organizations will provide essential support for low-income communities and communities of color most impacted by the pandemic. Voting yes on CIAG is a step forward for LA County towards building a more just cultural infrastructure that centers racial and economic equity in our recovery. We hope you will continue to champion equitable access to the arts by meaningfully including them in the upcoming stimulus spending bill, as well as all other community investment initiatives. Thank you and happy Arts Month to you all. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Ellen Giese. 
Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is Ellen Giese. I'm a resident of District 5, and I would like to speak on agenda items 42, 55A, 55C, and general public comment. With regards to 42, I cannot state how strongly I oppose this item, and I would like to point out that the, dec the decrease in use of force incidents from 2019 to 2020 also ignores the confounding factor of COVID-19. This report does not consider the significant drop in jail population that came about as a result of community organizing and advocacy efforts. Considering that the Los Angeles jail population decreased about 20 to 30 percent once the pandemic hit, the decrease in use of force incidents is almost exactly proportional to the decrease in jail population. This shows very clearly that attempts to de-escalate at de-escalation and force mitigation training had very little actual impact and that the decrease in incidents can almost entirely be attributed to a decrease in the number of people for LASD to terrorize inside the prison. With regards to 55A, I also oppose this. My concern is that the people most vulnerable to camera surveillance are our unhoused neighbors. We cannot escape the view that the ca these cameras in the places they live and travel LASD and LAPD frequently use surveillance footage like this to criminalize unhoused people, often via the county's LACRIS facial recognition system. In regards to Agenda 55C, I'm very strongly in favor of this, no, tentatively in favor of this, because there are a couple problems, but thank you, Barger, for bringing something that will move us forward. Marginalized youth are one of many vulnerable populations affected by carceral system. In addition to reimagining the Challenger camp, the board should invest in community-led ATI capital construction projects. When the board adopted an ATI vision for Los Angeles, they promised to invest in care over cages. That means fully funding- Thank you. You now have one minute to address your general public comment. Please begin. This cannot happen one project at a time, and that leads me directly into my general public comment, which is to fully fund Measure J. We want these services. We need these services. We were promised these services. We voted for Measure J. We voted for it to be funded because we want to see a meaningful change in LA County, a real and true reimagining of what these systems can be if we rebuild them from the ground up into systems of support and care that do not prioritize law enforcement funds and that do not allow the law enforcement in our communities to continue to terrorize us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Shelby Eggers, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Please begin. Next, we have Michelle King. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Thank you. I'm a resident of District 1 speaking at items. In favor of item 55C, I oppose 42 and 55A. I would also uh, like to speak on uh, general public comment. As a LA County resident, I'm appalled by the statistics contained in the report from LASD to the board. It's just disturbing to listen to them brag that their use of force incidents have decreased from 2019 to 20. 28% is not impressive or something to applaud. Like other Angelinos, I want jail to close and community members safe from LASD violence not slightly less likely to face it while incarcerated. And this report showcases how law enforcement cannot be reformed. Our community will be more safe when LASD doesn't have the power and impunity to use force against anyone. Unsurprisingly, the, use of, uh, the decrease in use of force ignores COVID-19, just like LASD who refused to wear masks under the largest super spreaders in LA County. The jail population decreased by 20 to 30% once the pandemic hit, showing that this is exactly, exactly the decrease of uh, use force instances proportional to the decrease in jail population. 
attempts at de-escalation of force mitigation training had very little actual impact. It's entirely due to community mobilization that caused jail populations to decrease. How many more reports do we have to hear from Alex Villanueva as he explains away the death and destruction that his deputies have inflicted on LA? How many more times do we have to sit and listen to LASD talk about their insufficient attempts at training and reform when the solution is clear? How many more board of supervisors does Villanueva need to threaten before we act? Force mitigation and ethics training are band-aid solutions to the problem of carceral harm. The problem is LASD themselves, a violent carceral institution that profits off the incarceration of black and brown communities. No amount of half-hearted attempts at force mitigation or presentations from the sheriff will fix this. It's time to shut down downtown jails. It's time for the board to make good on their promise to close down cages and care for our communities. To delay implementation any longer is to accept the inhumane conditions, to accept the ra racial disparities, and to accept warehousing people with mental health conditions in jails. I'm calling on the board to fulfill its promise of a care for LA County by immediately and fully funding Measure J, expanding funding for ODR, and taking de decisive action in closing Men's Central Jail. 10% Thank you. You now have one minute to address your general public comment. Please begin. Is between 360 and 900 million dollars. Allocating a measly 100 million is completely unacceptable. It's a dangerous precedent to cut corners on public health, safety, and care during a pandemic. 10% is the floor, not the ceiling. Allocating any less is a failure by the CEO and the county to be responsive to the immediate needs of the county. The board, must, the board must take the same decisive actions towards the closure of Men Central. In July, the Board of Supervisors requested a report detailing the pathway to close Men Central Jail within a year. Now there is a plan the county must act. There's no need for new data or results when communities have dedicated years in creating recommendations, report plans to close MCJ and found alternatives to incarceration. Work groups have named the number of beds needed, budgets, and the funding sources. They've named what has happened in court, in the jails, and in the community. The API report contains over 114 recommendations, and it was published last year. Now we have the LA County MCJ closure report and the passage of Measure, measure J. I call on the county to stop wasting time and do the right thing. We Thank you. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Save the lives of our loved ones being where. Joseph Cheng, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm addressing the item number five. Uh, Madam uh, President and the supervisors, um, good morning. My name is Joseph Cheng. I'm a resident in Hacienda Heights. For almost 45 years, I have never experienced this uh, uh, situation before. I believe this all started from the beginning of the pandemic last year. I have a ta talent in the leave the house and uh, in the backyard of this uh, family, uh, constantly you know, throwing the, the trash to the backyard and uh, also use a very harsh language toward them because uh, simply they are uh, Chinese uh, couples and uh, they shout at them, go back to your country. And uh, those couples are scared in the, in the, in the, in the house. And uh, also we have uh, uh, Asian American teachers in the school confront some few students. They loudly ask those teachers go back to their countries. There's also uh, Asian um, parents and Asian American parents and uh, she, she couldn't send her uh, Thank you. Your time has expired. Uh, Next speaker, please. Lori Archie, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Um, hi, this is Lori Archie, and I'll be speaking on public comment. Um, I'm in Jenna Hans district. I call in every week. I'm the mom with two toddler boys that can't occupy our own house due to the moratorium. Today marks about 70 days of being homeless. I'm looking forward to seeing how you could help my situation. Uh, and um, as the more a change, the moratorium is the only hope for me and my family. The tenant did not respond back to the Department of Consumer Affairs request for mediation. Last week, I tried to repair some safety things mentioned on the inspection report and a leaky roof. He denied me entry. I'm hoping at some point the denial of entry can change as well as there's people out there that could be damaging property. And there's no reason for this single high income guy to deny me entry when we were all wearing masks. It's getting increasingly tough to find places to stay with spring break and summer, not to mention the financial strain on us. I appreciate your help in any way. Thanks for listening to me. 
Thank you. Next speaker, please. Genevieve Coverall, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Dr. Genevieve Claverol. Uh, I'm going to speak to S1-21-1842. On S1, uh, we are making great progress in uh, providing a vaccine for the underprivileged. That's great. Kudo to Dr. Ferrer. And on uh, number 18, about the maternal uh, work to prevent maternal deaths and infant deaths is great. It's about time. Item 42 on the ROSA report, we still having huge amount of complaints, both from the inmates and from the staff about the sheriff. Really look at that report very carefully today when you review it. Another item 25, 21 of LASA will have been postponed again. This item should not be postponed. It was postponed starting in 10 19 again on 11 19 and now it has been postponed to 6 19 It's good to have been almost two years that we have not been able to review the report from NASA. What, you know, we need to really look what's going on and what the issue we have with a lot of the homeless, especially since they have refused to do the 20, the 20 uh, census. So please look at that report. Don't, re you know, don't postpone anymore. Thank you for your... Thank you for listening, and uh, I hope that we can go back to open meetings soon because I'm missing seeing you guys and have a nice week. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And as a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press 1 then 0 at this time. Do not press 1 then 0 a second time or you will be removed from the queue. Gabriela Vasquez, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Good morning, Honorable Chairwoman Police and members of the board. My name is Gabriela Vasquez. I'm a resident in the First District and organizer with La Defensa and Justice LA. I will speak on agenda item 42, 55A, 55C, and general public comment. Um, for 42, I'm, I'm in opposition. The statistics contained in the report from the Sheriff's Department to the board show a decrease from 2019 to 2020 of 28%. This decrease is um, actually very correlated to the number of folks that were de uh, released from the prison, about 20 to 30% once the pandemic hit. So I'm not really sure why uh, Alex Villanueva is, is proud of this. It's uh, is very correlated. Um, he explained the way the death and destruction that his deputies um, inflict on Angelinos uh, with this report, which is absolutely wrong. No amount of presentations from the sheriff will fix this. It's actually time to shut down downtown jails. It's time for the board to make good on their promises and to close down cage, uh, the cages um, that are uh, holding our loved ones and to provide care for our community. On agenda item 55A, I'm also in opposition. These cameras will function as po police surveillance and expand criminalization of black, brown, and Asian communities, especially as the footage feeds into the architecture of mass surveillance that the sheriffs and the other law enforcement want to have so that they can track folks, ha have um, documentation of their faces, their movements, their locations, and who they associate with. Um, so I'm uh, very much opposed with that um, uh, agenda item. To 55C, I am in favor tentatively uh, marginalized youth uh, are one of the most vulnerable populations affected by the carceral system. Um, in addition to reimagining the challenger camp, the board should invest in community-led ATI capital construction projects. When the board adopted the ATI vision for LA, they promised to invest in care over cages, some fully funding community-led projects and community-based services. Uh, while the plans for this memorial youth camp were created prior to ATI motion passing, the recommendations from the ATI report must be adopted for this project and uh, fully uh, visualized through this project. Thought should be given to the lack of access to basic life services and amenities in the area. Which Thank you. You now have one minute to address your general public comment. Please begin. For, for general public comment, I would like to uh, urge the board 
to close Men's Central Jail. Um, everybody is ready for this. There is no more need for reports. There's plenty of recommendations to act on this immediately in the ATI report. Um, for Measure J, I urge the board to uh, look to the historical moment that Angelinos uh, achieved last November in voting in Measure J. Um, we cannot uh, work with $100 million as a community that is you know, not going to create real change and really uh, move with this historic vision that we that we push so deeply for, right? Our collective goal was to make history, and to do so uh, without real money is not going to happen. Um, for uh, I also wanted to bring up the alternative crisis uh, response. This uh, meeting, these meetings have been held and um, led mostly by sheriff's department, which I think is contrary to the intention of ATI and the plan to remove crisis response for behavior of crisis from law enforcement. Uh, we Thank you. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Tran Hong, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. This is Trang Huang. Uh, this is a public comment on item 5, LA County Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Good morning. My name is Dr. Trang Huang from the SSG API Alliance. We work across LA County with AAPI families living with chronic and persistent illness. Thank you for the, op the opportunity to share today. In the midst of the pandemic, we service providers have been in crisis response mode, addressing the severe needs of vulnerable populations. Since last summer, we also responded to the public discourse of diversity and inclusion on different levels with our communities, personal safety, social structural inequity inequities, health access disparity and intersectionality. We wanna support the board motion put forth by Supervisor Han today. The proposed work group will open the space for inclusion to hear from community voices. And the time to participate is now when we all feel the intensity of hate crimes and fear. We will support the board motion to mobilize community-based groups for their input. Thank you, we your time has expired. Work. Next speaker, please. Mary Sue, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, Honorable Chair Suri and all the member of supervisors. My name is Mary Sue and I'm the former mayor of Warner and also the founder of the Chinese American Parent Association at Warner Valley Unified School District. Uh, today I'm going to speak uh, on the item five. First of all, I would like to thank all the supervisors for your excellent job during this pandemic. The reason I'm here today is to support item five, ARDI fund. I want to especially thank Supervisor Han for initiating these items. It is very important to make this fund available to AAPI, and NHPI communities because it is the best way to put an end to the racism. It, it is also through education that we will be able to prevent and stop racism. Has an active participa uh, participant in San Gabriel Valley's educational and civic affair for the past 25 years. Thank you. I Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Tobin DeMarco, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Tobin. I'm a resident of District 4. I would like to speak in opposition of agenda item 42 and 55A and also speak on general public comment. As a Los Angeles County resident, I'm appalled by the statistics contained in the report from the LASD to the board. It's disturbing to listen to LASD brag that their use of force incidents have decreased from 2019 to 2020. A decrease of 28% is not impressive or anything to applaud. Frankly, I'm not frankly, I am not demanding a decrease in use of force incidents. I'm asking for use of force incidents not be a category that we have to be concerned about. I, like thousands of other Angelinos, want jails closed and community members safe from LASD violence, not slightly less likely to face it while incarcerated. 
This report showcases how law enforcement cannot be reformed and attempts at de-escalation and forced mitigation training have very little actual impact and that the decrease in these incidents can almost entirely be attributed to a decrease in the number of people for LASD to terrorize instead of prisons because of the effects COVID-19 had on prison population. In regards to 55A, we need to be careful about moments of crisis and violence against our communities being used to expand policing. Every time violence like this happens, police quickly turn to expand surveillance and criminalization, which are later used to turn around and harm the same communities. We're not falling for that anymore. I remember what happened after the Black Lives Matter protests last summer. Police quickly started gathering closed circuit TV and other camera footage and worked to identify people from the crowds using the county's facial recognition system. Expanding police cameras will always expand criminalization, and that is not what our communities need. As far as my general public comment, the county needs to staff implementation of the plan to close Men's Central Jail immediately. There are plenty of recommendations to act on from the ATI report and from the Measure J subcommittee process that apply to the Men's Central Jail closure. To do anything other than that is unconscionable. These actions cannot be taken individually. ATI is an expansive wraparound vision that requires action to be taken in tandem. Closing Men's Central Jail cannot be done without funding ODR and the resources necessary to support people re-entering. And funding ODR is an empty promise if these dollars aren't going to re-entry communities that need it most. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press 1 then 0 at this time. Do not press 1 then 0 a second time or you will remove yourself from the queue. Queue in Bollock, please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Please begin. Hi, my name is Quia and I'm going to be speaking on item five. I'm a college student at the Claremont Colleges and a member of our Vietnamese American Student Association. And I'd like to express my support for item five as a motion to protect communities of color, namely the AAPI and NHPI communities in Los Angeles from the surge of hate crimes. As an Asian American college student, I'd like to stand in solidarity, not just with my aunts, uncles, parents, and grandparents, but with all of our communities especially our Asian American elders, many of whom have sacrificed so much for us as family, friends, and neighbors. They've cared for generations like mine, and it's time we care for them and protect them too. Through this motion, I believe we can provide our communities with the resources we need to heal, grieve, grow, and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Arunar Smone, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Please begin. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to speak on items 42, 55A, 55C, and general public comment. Um, uh, I am in favor of item 55C. I oppose uh, items 42 and 55A. Uh, I'm very concerned about the Roses report. Uh, the Sheriff's Department should not be taking credit for a decrease in uh, incidents of violence that is less than the decrease in uh, the number of prisoners in the jail system due to COVID. That is not a sign of success. It's actually a sign of failure. Um, and moreover, uh, we should not be satisfied with only a 26% decrease in uh, use of force incidents. Uh, rather, the uh, goal should be zero use of force incidents, particularly zero uh, shootings of unarmed people. 
Um, I also want to make clear my concern about uh, funding for uh, the Sheriff's Department more generally because the uh, LA County Sheriff's Department uh, and specifically Sheriff Villanueva have uh, continuously resisted the uh, efforts of the board to bring accountability and transparency. The uh, decrease in the number of uh, uh, prisoners uh, was something that the sheriff uh, dragged his feet on and uh, tried to minimize. So again, that is not something that he should be receiving um, uh, praise for, but rather criticism. Uh, I uh, wish to also uh, express uh, my desire to see the um, board. You now have action. one minute to address your general public comment. Please begin. Thank you. And, and so I'd uh, also like to make sure that the board um, uh, does whatever it can to uh, transfer funds from law enforcement to um, uh, alternative programs that do not involve um, uh, armed response. Uh, as an Asian American in District 3 in Schillacule's district, I also want to say that I oppose the installation of public safety cameras. These are not for our benefit, and we have seen that these can be used against us. So I, I urge the board to reject uh, that uh, agenda item 55A as well. And finally, I support the repurposing and reimagining of the Challenger Memorial Youth Camp. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next and speaker, please. Want... Connie Chung Jo, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I will be speaking in support of item number five, in support of item number 16, in opposition of item 55A, and making general public comment. Good morning. I am Connie Chung Jo, the CEO of Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles, the nation's largest legal services and civil rights organization for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. For item, item number five, I fully support Supervisor Han's motion to invest $1 million into the LA County Equity and Diversity Fund. We need to be investing more into Asian American education to understand the pattern of practice of targeting Asian American countries for centuries. We need to fund practices that create safety and address hatred in our county and that are focused on community-based interventions, such as multiracial coalitions and bystander intervention training. The rate of anti-Asian hate continues to escalate in this pandemic, and the highest number of reports are coming from LA County and the Bay Area. LA County needs to commit these additional funds and strategies to create safety for Asian Americans and to end racism. For item number 16, I fully support Supervisor Solis' motion for COVID-19 vaccine for residents of all languages. Within the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities of LA County, we have more than 40 ethnic groups who speak more than 40 languages. More than half of our community members are foreign born and speak a language other than English at home. The majority of the LA County threshold languages are AA and HPI. At L as LA County operated points of dispensing, residents must get screened about their health conditions before they can get vaccine. So it's important that someone is able to ask these technical medical questions in their language to explain what can happen after that if the vaccine is dispensed and the process for getting a second shot in case that is required. With the wide breadth of eight of languages spoken in our community and the large number of uh, limited English proficient uh, community members, it's critical that we ensure language access at all of these distances. Thank you. You now have one sure minute to address your general public comment. Please begin. For, I for item number 55A, I am opposed to the motion to add surveillance cameras to public streets. The infusion of more law enforcement and surveillance on car, on car license plates makes many of our community members feel less safe, not more. And we know that it has a disproportionate impact on other communities of color. More than 90% of the Asian hate incidents that are occurring do not rise to the level of a hate crime. 
even when they are hate crimes, what we saw in the case of an Asian woman being brutally beaten in New York City is that cameras that captured the moment did not protect her safety. Instead, from surveillance, what we saw was that she was ignored and that the security guards closed the door on her. What we need to do is offer things like bystander intervention training, which teach residents how to safely intervene and de-escalate a situation if they see an Asian being harassed. What we do not need is more cameras that create a feeling of insecurity for many of our community members. And I would like to add that advancing- Thank you, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Laura Koholan, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, my name is Laura Koholan. I would like to speak on agenda items 42, 55A, 55C, and general public comment. Um, I'm an organizer with White People for Black Lives, Justice LA, Reimagine LA, and La Defensa, and I am a resident of District 2. I strongly oppose agenda item 42. A reduction in use of force incidents is not enough. We know that we must absolutely eradicate use of force in our communities, and this starts by funding infrastructures of care rather than continuing to fund the bloated, harmful, and lethal Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I also strongly oppose agenda item 55A and want to echo the sentiments of Asian American community members on this call who have noted that increased police surveillance does not keep our communities safe and that instead we might we must fight anti-asian racism with mediums other than surveillance and hyper policing we know that whenever our communities experience hate crimes it is a common practice of law enforcement to use these incidents to stoke terror and fear in our communities and instead we know that we must fund authentic public safety which starts with investing in broad cultural shifts against asian american hate rather than simply um, stoking surveillance and investing in voted law enforcement budget. Like my fellow community members on this call, I tentatively support agenda item 55C. We know that investing in care for our black and brown youth is essential and that we can't be investing in youth camps um, the ways that we have been in the past. We must use the recommendations of the alternative to incarceration report to guide the reimagining of this site and we must have community participation be continued and authentic for input and oversight as we reimagine this site to build authentic public safety, health, and reinvestment for our youth. For general public comment, I want to amplify the clarion call from community organizers who've been mobilizing in the streets as well as at um, gatherings such as this one to both close MCJ and fully fund Measure J. Regarding the closure of MCJ, community members are tired of waiting for more data, reports, and planning, and frankly, the demand to do these things is a slap in the face to impacted community members and leaders who've continually had to demonstrate the trauma time and time again that MCJ has inflicted upon our loved ones. MCJ steals the lives of our community members, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is constantly enacting violence against our people inside the jail. It puts our people's lives at risk because of the spread of COVID-19 in the jails, and it keeps our people away from our families, from employment, and from education. And we know that we have the plans in place to close Men's Central Jail because we had the alternatives to incarceration recommendations, over 114 of them completed for over a year now, and we have broad swaths of dollars available for reinvestment into alternatives to incarceration due to the community one passage of Measure J as well as other funding streams. In keeping with the demand to close- Thank you, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Tony Torn, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, I'm here to support the agenda item slide. Uh, Dear honorable chair and supervisors, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Tong, and I'm currently the VP of the Wanna Valley Unified School District Board. In addition, I also uh, volunteer for various nonprofit organizations such as the uh, Diamond Bar Evergreen Senior Club and Diamond Bar Chinese American Association. Today, I want to uh, strongly commend and support Agenda IT5, Supervisor Hong and Mitchell's uh, a motion to form a working group to study and provide recommendations regarding how the county can address 
the rise and continuation of hate and violence directed toward the AAPI communities. Representative Diamond by Evergreen Senior Club, we really, really appreciated any of our your efforts to uh, remove or reduce the hate crime that seems to target the most vulnerable seniors. So please support this motion and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. As a reminder, to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press 1 and 0 at this time. Do not press it a second time or you will be removed from the queue. Michelle Wetland, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Hello? Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm in opposition of uh, 42 and 55A in favor of 55C and public comment. I heard that Max Huntsman is in attendance today. Um, I would like to encourage uh, the board to listen to the Office of Inspector General, who's been working for years at a ridiculously slow process in regards to the corruption of LASD. Um, it is time to shut down the downtown jails, and it's time for the board to make good on their promises to close down cages and care for our communities. No amount of presentations from the sheriff is going to fix their violence and cruelty. LASD reports show very clearly that attempts of de-escalation and force mitigation training have had very little actual impact, and that the decrease of incidents is almost entirely from the actual decrease in the number of people that LASD had to terrorize inside of their jails. So I'm just asking, do you agree that it is dishonest for the sheriff to draw a connection between half-hearted trainings and fewer uses of force when this is entirely due to the community mobilization that caused jail populations to, de to decrease? And how do you continue to fund and contribute this lying and torture of your constituents? As far as 55A, no more expansion of surveillance in LA County. Boston and Portland have banned the expansion of facial recognition technology because of its civil rights failures. Uh, southern cities as far as south as Jackson, Mississippi have had the foresight to, ba to ban this harmful technology before it arrives. It's already here and funded through LAPD. No more wasteful dollars for corruption, constitutional harm, and failed policies. As far as 55C, the recommendations from the ATI report need to be adopted for this project. Community engagement and stakeholders, including the community oversight of the Challenger Society, should be integrated. Thank you. You now have one minute left site. to address your general public comment. Please begin. Thank you. So it uh, should be integrated into the planning of the repurposed site for the success of all involved. As far as my public comment, closed men's central jail, Fully Fund Measure J, and I'm going to start this with uh, the words of Supervisor Barger from July 7th of 2020. Because many in that jail who are suffering from mental illness are in that jail because of their mental illness. And no doubt the crime they committed, if we had gotten to them before they committed the crime, they would not end up in our jail. And I can tell, tell you, having been here for a long time, Men's Central Jail 30 years ago, was problematic. Supervisor Barger, those were your words on July 7th of 2020. In fact, we now know that there's over 6,100 of those inside the most populated jail on the planet are there because of mental illness. It's time to care for our communities, reimagine public safety, and provide solutions that actually Thank you. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Cora Plus, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, good morning. I'm speaking in support of item number five. My name is Cora Plus, a member of East San Gabriel Citizen Against Crime with a mission of fighting crime in our Asian American community. I live in a high Asian American populated community of Roland Heights and Hashemba Heights, and our community is sure feeling the pain from the rising hate crime. So our group met with Supervisor Han, Field Deputy Lawrence in our in an outdoor 
Park in Mid Marsh to voice our residents' fear of the rampant crime going around us. And today, we already seen Supervisor Hines response so quickly and take our request seriously. We just want to say your this initiative is deeply appreciated. It means a lot to our community. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Jessica Craven, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi. Okay. Uh, my name is Jessica Craven. I would like to speak on agenda item 42, 55A, 55C, and general public comment, if I may. Yes, I mean, please begin. Not, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, agenda item 42, I oppose. Uh, for the same reasons that everybody else has spoken about, um, I recently read, and I hope that everybody on this call has also read, the 14 or 15 part series by Cerise Castle um, in Knock, LA. It is called The Tradition of Violence. If you haven't read it, it is a history of deputy gangs in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and it made me want to throw up. I could not sleep the night after I read it. It is revolting and a great deal of it talks about um, men's central jail and about the gang culture in the LA Sheriff's Department. It, this is beyond fixing. This department is rotten to the core, including Sheriff Villanueva. Um, so we are not demanding a decrease in use of force incidents because that's not possible with these individuals in, in charge. Um, this culture is pervasive. It runs through the entire Sheriff's Department. We need to get rid of this department and start over from the ground up. Um, and uh, with everybody else, I agree that the decrease in use of force incidents is either from underreporting or it's ignoring the co-founding uh, factor of COVID-19. Um, ethics training is not going to do it. These are Band-Aid solutions to the problem of carceral justice in general, and then the problem of our sick, sick, demented, and I am not exaggerating, read this article. Um, Sheriff's Department, which I, I am a longtime resident of Los Angeles. I'm an elected member of the Los Angeles County Democratic Party. I am sick to my core over the fact that this has been tolerated and that the Board of Supervisors has known about this for a very, very, very long time. So I also oppose agenda item 55A. I also uh, am in favor of agenda item 55C. Um, and Thank I you. You now have one minute left to address your general public comment. Please begin. Okay. I just I, I, I will yield the rest of my time other than just saying if you have not read these articles, especially um, I am a, a resident of District 1. I urge my Board of Supervisor member to do it. Um, Holly Mitchell, for whom I phone banked, you must understand, and I'm sure you do, but what is happening is it's 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 a, I can't even. I just can't. I'm going to yield the rest of my time. The sheriff's department needs to be fully defunded. There is, a, it's, a, it's, it's irredeemable. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Chuck Sun, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello. Hello, my name is Chuck Sun, living in Roland Heights. I am a member of East St. Gable Citizen Against Crime. I'm here to support Supervisor Hans motion number five, item number five. Roughly two weeks ago in our East St. Gable Valley, a racist charged his car through the peaceful Stop Asian Hate protesters. I can say this appalling case really hit home to our community. The root of the problem is in people's mindset. That's why I like the idea in the initiative to promote unity and solidarity such as, number one, continue to enhance the effort to provide education and prevention, two, provide you know, direct proper department and together with all stakeholders like community members to come up with good recommendations. There are more I cannot elaborate due to time constraints. In the end, I'd like to thank you all for moving this initiative forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Norbert Tan. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Good morning, Norbert Tan speaking in favor of agenda item five and general public comments. May I begin? 
Yes, please begin. Good morning. I'm Norbert Tan, the Deputy Director of APCON, the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council. We are a consortium of 40 Asian American Pacific Islander nonprofits in the Los Angeles area that serve over one and a half million residents of Asian American descent in our county. We urge the board to adopt this motion to allow for the RD work group to provide you recommendations and strategies on how to address hate and violence directed towards our AAPI community and provide support in the county's equity work priorities. APCON co-founded Stop AAPI Hate, the nation's leading aggregator of Asian anti-Asian hate incidents and crime. Since March of last year, we've recorded nearly 4,000 hate incidents and crimes against our community, with 358 incidents occurring in L.A. County. 10% of these incidents have involved physical assault. We've also seen a 155% increase in reported mental health impacts. We now have one minute left to address your general public comment. Please begin. Uh, mental health impacts affecting our community members due to the rise in anti-Asian hate since the beginning of the pandemic. So we urge the county's anti-racism, diversity, and inclusion initiative to address these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Herb Hatanaka, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Comment. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Herb Hatanaka, the executive director of SSG, and here as a county resident to speak in support of Supervisor Han's motion. Since the founding of the county's LA versus hate initiative by Supervisor Solis, the community is grateful to this board for continuing to support a countywide response and services for our people who encounter these acts of hate and violence. This motion by Supervisor Han builds upon that work and importantly extends the Board of Supervisors' commitment to create a comprehensive API agenda and strategy. This motion elevates our voices and needs to the highest level of county government by including our API community leaders in the creation of this initiative, along with relevant county departments. You know, this issue is deeply personal to me. I've been called a Jap, a gook, a slant-eyed so-and-so, and told, back, told to go back home many times throughout my life. And frankly, I thought that this kind of hate towards me and my people was behind us. Unfortunately not. Thank you, supervisors, for standing with us. I support the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Charles Manson, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, thank you. Good morning. This is Charles Manson calling, and I'd like to address 4-1-D, 13, 21, and 38. Um, I'm wondering about the neighborhood deterioration. I, I noticed in a newspaper article that there was another hospital that closed down, a, a private hospital closed down, and I was wondering if the Board of Supervisors has looked into the possibility of purchasing this hospital and repurposing it to use as a mental health clinic to help people instead of putting them in, in incarcerating them. It's already there. It could be repurposed and used to uh, as as a help an aid to help in the communities. There's another hospital that closed earlier this year. Again, the board did not look into buying it. Uh, I'm also wondering, with all the money that the state has gotten, if they're looking to clean up some of the, um, like Exide and uh, the waste, the toxic waste sites that are, that exist throughout California. Uh, I'm wondering also if if Dr. Ferrara could answer a question about the false negatives and the false positives that come up on these tests for the COVID virus. And is there a true negative and a true positive? Because some of the protocols just seem to be so off the wall. Uh, I was wondering if they would be considering high, uh, funding more money for the D.D. Hirsch suicide prevention. I think that they should have Denim Day become a month-long or even a year-long process to stop some of the violence against women that occurs in the, throughout the community. I'm tired of listening to exclusive negotiating agreements with one contractor. It doesn't seem to be helping anybody in, without the community. And I'm wondering if the board has any idea what to do about the trade, commerce, and tourism industry that has suffered greatly 
to, because of this COVID virus, that the jobs that have been lost throughout the commerce, the, the trade and, and restaurant industry have greatly affected a lot of the communities, especially because these protocols keep changing on a time to a day-to-day basis. And the funding grants that have been issued by the, the Thank the, you. Your uh, time has expired. Next speaker, please. Years. You know that. Uh, Armin Ross, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Armin Ross, I'm speaking on agenda item uh, 1D. I'm not making a public comment. Uh, I represent the Crenshaw Chamber of Commerce, and we would like to see the exclusive negotiating agreement with wide companies extended uh, for one more year with another year uh, optional. This project is sorely needed uh, in our community. Uh, the community is dying for lack of um, uh, market rate housing, for lack of new uh, businesses and services. This project will bring uh, needed housing, both market rate and affordable housing to our community. We'll also bring in a new grocer. We just lost two grocers in the Crenshaw community. Uh, we need a new grocery and we need the other businesses that they will be bringing in and hopefully this will be the shot in the arm uh, that the Crenshaw community needs to uh, uplift itself the way that the rest of this uh, beautiful city uh, is being up uplifted by economic development and investment. For many years, Crenshaw was ignored. South LA has been ignored as far as investment. This is a wise Thank you. Your time has metro. expired. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Angela DeMarco, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Hello. Okay. Thank you. I'm calling in on item number six to establish the reward offer for the investigation of assault of victim Leonard Taylor. I'm his daughter, Angela, and I obviously support this measure. We're looking to receive $10,000 from the Board of Supervisors, and we'd like to say thank you ahead of time to Janice Hahn's office for uh, leading the charge on this. Our father was assaulted on March 5th around 3 p.m. on a visit, very busy street corner on a Friday afternoon. He was attacked from behind where he was hit on the head and lit on fire. He was able to um, have the wherewithal to call 911 and to get himself emergency services, but had he not, he certainly would not have survived. Um, he sustained second and third degree burns over the upper part of his body, and after four and a half weeks, he's still lying in the hospital in the ICU unit. Our dad is our only parent left. Our mother, my, to my sister and I, had uh, passed away about eight months ago, and um, at this time, we have no evidence and no suspects, and the public is still at risk. So we're asking for $10,000 to add Thank to you. our Thank you. Your time reward. has expired. Next speaker, please. And to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press 1 then 0 at this time. If you press 1 then 0 a second time, you will be removed from the queue. Terry Chin, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Please begin. Yeah. Next speaker, please. Shelby Eggers, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, uh, my name is Shelby. Um, I would like to speak on items 42, 55A, and 55C in general public comment. Please begin. Um, I'm a resident of Los Angeles. Uh, Hopefully that's obvious. Um, regarding item 42, uh, the, the decrease in use of force incidents from like 2019 to 2020 uh, that is bragged about in LASD's report does not include the 20 to 30% drop in jail population thanks to community organizing. Um, it's super dishonest for the sheriff to draw these conclusions um, and, and, and try to indicate that like force mitigation ethics training are, the, are you know, why that's happening when that's absolutely not the case. Um, LASD is a completely rotten institution, and uh, as we've seen with the extensive reporting someone mentioned earlier from Knock LA, um, which you should all read about the deputy about the deputy gang, 
um, in LASD, which includes Villanueva. Um, they have committed hundreds of vicious crimes and cost taxpayers millions of dollars in lawsuits. So more training won't fix this. It's time to shut down downtown jails and for the board to fulfill their promise to transfer funds to the community. Um, also abolish LASD while you're at it. Um, regarding item 55A, you are proposing police cameras and surveillance of our communities. This is the literal opposite of what people want. More police does not mean more safety. If you care about fighting Asian hate crimes, listen to the community. I went to a rally a few weeks ago in Little Tokyo and the community explicitly said over and over that they want to defund the police and fund communities. Expanding police cameras will expand criminalization of black, brown, Asian communities, not help them. Also regarding 55C, um, I'm in favor of this. It could help tackle the realities of prison pipelines that affect marginalized youth. Um, for general public comment, um, close Men's Central Jail and fund Measure J. The public told you back in November by voting in favor of Measure J that that is what they want. This is not some far-fetched idea. There are plenty of recommendations and specific plans you can act on immediately from the ATI report and the Measure J subcommittee process. They are doing this work for you. Your job is to listen to your community. So please do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Terry Chin, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Please Terry begin. Chin, you may be on mute. Next speaker, please. Devin Hartman, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, thank you. I just have a, a general public comment to start with. Please begin. Good morning, Honorable Chair Solis and members of the board. Uh, my name is Devin Hartman, the CEO of Chirp Locally Grown Power. We're feeling very celebratory right now, and we wanted to share that celebration with the board and with the public, because with the support from the state of California and hundreds and hundreds of donors, we are now ready to open the first nonprofit solar panel assembly factory in the world in Pomona, California. Many of you know that this was developed as a prototype factory that can now be replicated throughout the county and the country, and they're designed to be placed in the heart of our most disadvantaged communities. We're focused on massive mitigation of greenhouse gases, hyper-local job creation in advanced manufacturing and construction, local economic revitalization, and economic justice and equity by providing free energy for our lowest income. Thank you, your time has expired. Standards. Next speaker, please. Michelle Alger Minty, please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Michelle Alger Minty. I'm a resident of District 2. I would like to speak against agenda items 42 and 55A tentatively in favor of 55C, as well as general public comment. Um, in regards to agenda item 42, it is disturbing to listen to LASD brag that their use of force incidents have decreased from 2019 to 2020, 2020 excuse me, a decrease of 28% is not impressive or something to applaud. This decrease in use of force incidents from 2019 to 2020 also ignores the confounding factor of COVID-19. This report does not consider the significant drop in jail population that came about as a result of community organizing and ad advocacy events. Considering that the Los Angeles jail population decreased by 20 to 30% once the pandemic hit, the decrease in use of force incidents is almost exactly proportional to the decrease in jail population. This shows very clearly that attempts at de-escalation and forced mitigation training had very little actual impact and that the decrease in incidents can almost entirely be attributed to a decrease in the number of people for LASD to terrorize inside of prisons. Force mitigation is not enough. Ethics training is not enough. These are band-aid solutions to the problem of partial justice. The problem is not that LASD doesn't have enough ethics training or enough de-escalation tactics. The problem is LASD themselves, a violent carceral institution that profits off the incarceration of black and brown communities. No amount of half-hearted attempts at force mitigation will fix this. 
No amount of presentations from the sheriff will fix this. It is time to shut down downtown jails. It is time for the board to make good on their promise to close down cages and care for their communities. To delay impl impl implementation any longer is to accept the inhumane conditions, to accept the racial disparities, and to accept warehousing people with mental health conditions in jail. In opposition to Agenda 55C, I'd like to say that police servant surveillance of our communities will expand everyone's criminalization and will not increase public safety. These cameras will expand criminalization of black, brown, and Asian communities, especially as the footage feeds into the architecture of mass surveillance that LASD, LAPD, and other police agencies use to track everyone's faces. You now have one minute left to address your general public comment. Please begin. Um, and in terms of my general public comment, please close the MCA MCG, excuse me, Men's Central Jail. <laughs> there are plenty of recommendations to act on immediately from the ATI report and from the Measure J subcommittee process that apply to MCJ closure. To do anything other than act and commit now is unconscionable. Now there's a plan and the county has to act. I in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, LA, Justice LA, Reimagine LA Coalition am now demanding that the county act on closing MCJ and fully funding Measure J. As was previously stated, we don't need another report to collect dust on the shelf. What we need to do is have the political will from the LA Board of Supervisors to close MCJ. I'm calling on the board to be bold and move with integrity, make good on your commitments to close MCJ, and call on the county to stop wasting time and do the right thing today. We must move with urgency to stop the harm and save the lives of our loved ones being warehoused in Men's Central Jail. Additionally, Measure J needs to be given the maximum amount of funding. Our communities are working to survive and recover from a deadly pandemic, and the board cannot stand idly by. We need these Thank measures. Thank you. Your time has expired. Than ever. Madam Chair, that concludes the one hour of public comment testimony. Thank you, Art. Time for public speakers has ended. Thank you all that called in to speak. If you were unable to provide your comments, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda. We'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Madam Executive Officer, please indicate the agenda items on which we will be voting. The following items are before you. Items 1D through 2D, 1 through 4, 6 through 11, 13 through 20, 22 through 41, 43 through 54, 55A through 55E, and 58. Moved by Supervisor Kuhl and seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve these items. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Yes. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, members. We'll now move to the set item S1, followed by item five, then items 12 and 42, and finishing up with item A7. Item S1, as you know, is a set matter on the public health order. This is a public opportunity for the board to discuss the closures and pandemic trends. Uh, we've asked uh, Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health, and Dr. Christina Galley, Director of Health Services, to provide the first part of this presentation. Thereafter, then we'll, uh, we can ask questions and then we'll continue to hear from Dr. Uh, Jonathan Sharon, who's Director of Mental Health, and Antonia Jimenez, Director of Public Social Services on the mental health impact and recovery of county residents. So let us begin then, uh, Dr. Uh, Ferrer and Dr. Galley. Uh, thank you and, and good morning, Supervisor Solis, and uh, thank you to the entire Board of Supervisors uh, for your steadfast leadership and ongoing support as we move forward on our recovery journey during this critical period. Your guidance and actions ensure that we swiftly and equitably make progress while keeping laser focus on communities that have been the hardest hit. And while we're encouraged by our vaccination efforts to date, and the promise of increasing vaccine supplies, and certainly our metrics are trending in the right direction, we do remain concerned about the potential for a rise in cases locally, following trends across the country and internationally, variants of concern that are circulating, and the inequitable gaps that remain in our vaccination efforts and case rates that continue to be the focus for an urgent attention. Today, I'll be providing updates on the current LA County COVID-19 data, potential risks to our progress, modifications to the health officer order that went into effect on Monday, 
as we moved into the state's orange tier. And lastly, an update on vaccination efforts. I'll take the first graph. This first graph shows our trend lines of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths from March 1st last year through March 28th, 2021. And as you can see, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths continue to fall. Three months ago, on January 5th, there were 14,200 daily cases. Since then, LA County has experienced a 97% drop in the number of daily cases, falling to fewer than 400 new cases in late March. Over that same three-month period, hospitalizations fell 92% from more than 8,000 daily hospitalizations to less than 600, 650 daily hospitalizations, again, as of the end of March. And since January 5th, the number of daily deaths has also dropped close to 100%, from 252 daily deaths on January 5th to nine daily deaths on March 28th. We do extend condolences to everyone who's lost a person they love to the virus, and we wish everyone healing and peace. Today, we're reporting 406 new cases, 568 people hospitalized with COVID-19, and 23 new deaths. The extraordinary progress we made reflects collective actions taken over the past few weeks. And thanks to everyone for doing the hard work that made this possible. I'll take the next slide. We do know that we'll need to continue following public health safety measures if we wanna sustain this progress, particularly with circulating variants the concerning increases in cases in other jurisdictions, and as we move into the orange tier with sector reopenings and increased capacity limits at various establishments, there will be more intermingling. There has been an alarming overall increase in cases within the United States over the last two weeks of 18%. Additionally, 31 states have seen cases rising in the last seven day period compared to the previous one. Four states in particular, Michigan, Florida, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, have seen steep increases in their cases. Moreover, the Northeast and the Midwest are reporting increases in incidence of COVID cases in those younger than 18. This is particularly true in Michigan and Minnesota. This trend may be attributed to the increase in the variant circulating at the same time that schools and youth sports have been reopening. During the pandemic, trends in other parts of the world and other parts of the country have always had an impact on LA County. This past year indicates that often the East Coast experiences increases in cases before the West Coast, and that typically LA County is a few weeks behind New York. While conditions have certainly changed, particularly because we vaccinated millions of people over the past three months, we don't yet have enough vaccine protection across the county to prevent more transmission if we're not extraordinarily careful over the next few weeks. I'll take the next slide. In addition to rising case numbers internationally and in many states, we also remain on alert about the potential risks that can thwart our progress due to circulating variants of concern that may be more transmissible. Known variants of concern include what we call the UK variant, the Brazil variant, the South African variant, the New York variant, and the California variant. All of these variants are known virus mutations that are probably more infectious than the more common strain of the virus. In LA County, of the 920 specimens sequenced to date at our public health lab, 12% have been identified as the UK variant. This is all since January 15th. 43% were identified as the California variant. This is since December. 3% um, uh, have, have been identified as what we call the New York variant of interest. And there have been two cases identified as the Brazil variant of interest. This is P2. While this is a very small sample size, results statewide in California indicate that variants are widely circulating and may make it easier for virus transmission to occur if we're not vigilant in practicing safety precautions. The state has reported 851 cases of the B117 UK variant, 10 cases of the South African variant, 35 cases of the Brazil P1 variant, this is a variant of concern, and over 9,300 cases of the California variant. 
Yesterday, as many of you heard, Stanford Health reported a double mutant coronavirus variant that they found in California. A similar variant is thought to be behind a surge in cases in India. This variant carries two mutations that help the virus attach to cells. One of the mutations in the new strain is like that found in the variants first detected in Brazil and South Africa. The second mutation found is like that noticed in the California variant. I wanna note that this is not an example of recombination. Rather, these two mutations have been detected in the same isolate. This is likely one virus with two sequential mutations. We know, however, that if there's more transmission of COVID-19, there is the risk of more variants dominating. We also know that we have strategies at hand to prevent transmission of the virus and that these strategies prevent transmission of the variants. So please keep doing what we've been doing to protect each other. Wear masks, keep your distance, hand wash, and avoid crowds. Uh, this all works to limit transmission. I'll take the next slide. Uh, last week, LA County qualified for the orange cheer and the state's blueprint for a safer e economy. With a 3.1 adjusted, with 3.1 adjusted cases per 100,000 residents, a seven-day average daily test positivity rate of 1.5 percent, and in areas areas with the fewest health-affirming resources, a test positivity rate of 2.1 percent. While the state today is changing the threshold to move to the less restrictive yellow tier from less than one case per 100,000 residents to less than two residents, two cases per 100,000 residents. Uh, this is because we've hit the 4 million mark of vaccinations in our hardest hit communities. We do anticipate that our tier metrics will not change significantly this week or next week based on the case numbers we've been reporting. In the orange tier, the state increases capacity limits at various businesses, including restaurants, retail, museums, Movie and movie theaters. And it offers other businesses an opportunity to move activities back indoors at very limited capacity. This includes card rooms and family amusement centers. Yesterday we did, uh, the new health officer order went into effect and it does have uh, some significant changes which I'll summarize very quickly. Outdoor live events and outdoor professional sporting events with audience are now permitted with the following safety modifications. Only in-state visitors can attend with advanced ticket reservations, and there's a 33% capacity limit. Food and drink needs to be delivered to guests in their seat or delivered to designated guest pickup areas. And there must be a weekly worker testing program. At amusement parks, they're also allowed to reopen to the public, again, with safety measures uh, that are uh, adhered to. Uh, the reopening plans for large theme parks and amusement parks need to be submitted ahead of time to the Department of Public Health. Parks are also only open for in-state visitors and visitors are limited to a 25% capacity with distancing requirements of six feet between households on all rides, lines, and transports. Uh, masks are required at all times and eating and drinking is only allowed in designated uh, eating and drinking areas. Bars that, cannot, that do not provide meals are allowed now to open outdoors with distancing, masking, and infection control measures. Indoor operations, I just wanna note, are not permitted for any bars with what's called a low risk permit. Uh, I wanna note that tables need to be eight feet apart, six people at a table, maximum of three different households at each table, there's no live entertainment, but te television viewing is permitted outdoors, and the hours of operation are right now from 11.30 a.m. until 10 p.m. Breweries, wineries, and distilleries have the same modifications required outdoors, but they can also now move back indoors at 25% capacity or 100 people, whichever is fewer. There are also uh, directives uh, for safety indoors including a maximum of six people at a table, all from the same household, uh, and um, the hours of operation, again, remain 11.30 to 10 p.m. Uh, grocery stores uh, can increase their capacity to 75%, along with other retail stores. Card rooms can now both operate outdoors and they can move indoors at 25% capacity. Again, eight feet of distancing between tables. Masks are always required 
and food and beverages remain banned from the card tables. Uh, restaurants, places of worship, movie theaters, and museums, zoos, and aquariums can increase their capacity indoors to 50% along with all of the safety modifications on distancing. Fitness centers also can now move indoors at 25% capacity. Indoor pools can now reopen and masks are always required unless people are swimming. Hair salons, barbershops, and personal care services also can increase indoor capacity to 75% occupancy, provided they can maintain six feet of distance. Uh, masks are required, except for those services where customers need to remove their masks for a short period of time. For those services where customers are removing their face coverings, staff need to wear a face shield in addition to a mask. Uh, family entertainment centers also now can uh, add to their um, operations, uh, operations indoors at 25% capacity for distance activities such as bowling or escape rooms and masks do remain required. Uh, the state uh, also uh, released the blueprint uh, for safer uh, modifications to the blueprint for safer economy uh, reopening framework yesterday that allows the county additional opportunities for activities that can resume with modifications uh, starting on April 15th. Uh, these updates uh, will include opportunities uh, for changes around gatherings, private events or meetings, and this includes like receptions or conferences, and indoor seated live events and performances. We'll review these new opportunities and work with the, bo the board on, on a set of recommendations and again, an additional set of modifications that we can make to the health officer order for next week. It is critically important that businesses follow the safety measures that are laid out in these protocols. As we've seen in the past, reopenings and increasing capacity limits can unfortunately lead to an increase in cases if we're not hypervigilant. We do ask that everyone take the precautions necessary to protect each other. Our inspectors are out and about and we're happy to provide any clarity or technical assistance to any businesses that need it. Uh, late last week, also, uh, and I'll take the next slide, the Centers for Disease Control issued guidance related to travelers who have been fully vaccinated. And effective yesterday, we updated our travel advisory. The CDC and the county continue to urge that everyone avoid non-essential travel during this time where there are significant hotspots across the country and the world, and there's a significant risk for more infectious variants. Travel is associated with additional risks. However, travelers who are fully vaccinated, meaning that two weeks have passed after their second dose for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, or after their single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, are, are going to be at lower risk, and they can now travel and will not be required to test or quarantine upon their arrival in LA County if they don't have any symptoms of illness. However, travels who are not fully vaccinated must continue to quarantine, and now it's for seven full days after travel if they can receive a negative COVID-19 test result taken three to five days after they've arrived in LA County. If the traveler doesn't get tested uh, after they arrive in LA County, they need to quarantine for the full 10 days. And all travelers, regardless of their vaccination status, should self-monitor themselves for symptoms for 14 days after their arrival, and they should get tested and isolate if they develop any symptoms. I'll take the next slide. Uh, with, as we noted, reopenings, there can be additional risk because more people are mingling with others in many more sites. We do mitigate this risk as much as possible by asking businesses to adhere to safety protocols that reduce possible exposures among workers and customers. And I wanna note that we're so grateful uh, for the tens of thousands of businesses that fully implement all of the public health directives and the health officer orders. Unfortunately, our health inspectors still encounter businesses that aren't adhering to the required protocol. This slide shows inspection results from March 15th through April 2nd. And I apologize for so much detail, but it does show the number of inspections that happened for several sectors the number of businesses that were out of compliance and the percentage of businesses that were in compliance. Environmental health inspectors found relatively high levels of compliance with health officer orders. However, there were patterns of non-compliance within some sectors. 
including as uh, including restaurants, where 12% of restaurants that had an inspection were non-compliant with physical distancing measures, and 5% were non-compliant with face coverings and face shields that needed to be provided and worn by their employees. Similar patterns were seen at our bars. For gyms, fitness centers, and fitness centers, 11% were out of compliance, mostly for customers not wearing face masks, and 12% were out of compliance around the physical distancing requirements. Uh, and we're a large county, so small percentages translate into uh, dozens and dozens of possible exposures. So we do ask everyone, please adhere fully uh, to the reopening protocols. Uh, this is how we continue on our recovery journey. Uh, I, on the next slide, I want to note uh, that we continue to visit our businesses. We provide a lot of education, but we do cite those with significant violations. This slide does show the number of citations issued over the last two-week period. And you can see that restaurants received most of the citations, 45, followed by gyms and fitness centers, where 10 citations had been issued. Uh, now I'd like to go on to the next slide and uh, provide you an update on our current overall efforts to vaccinate residents and workers in LA County. As of April 2nd, we've administered 4,641,178 doses of vaccine in the county. Of these, three, over slightly over 3 million were first doses, um, and that included 120,000, uh, more than 120,000 doses of the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, there were one point, almost 1 1.6 million uh, doses that were administered were second doses. More than 68% of LA County residents 65 and older have received at least one dose, while more than 34% of LA County residents 65 and older have now received both of their doses. And 33% of our residents 18 and older have also received one dose. This is obviously primarily a workers in eligible sectors along with adults who had uh, underlying health conditions and or disabilities that qualified them already for a vaccine. I'll take the next slide. Beginning uh, on April 1st, though, we were able to open up vaccinations to all persons 50 to 64 years of age who reside in the county, in addition to all of the other previously eligible groups. About 30%, 32% of the 2 million people in this age group have previously been vaccinating. And that means that there's about 1.4 million people that still needed to be vaccinated. Clearly, it'll take us a period of weeks to complete vaccinations in this age group, in addition to all of the other eligible groups. However, we're happy that we're now vaccinating at an accelerated pace. For example, this past week, we were able to uh, increase the number of vaccinations that we did at four of the five large capacity county, county vaccination sites. From what's been approximately about 2,000 vaccinations a day at each site uh, to moving up to closer to 4,000 vaccinations a day. Uh, we were able to manage this increased volume without difficulty and we're prepared to be able to sustain this increase when we're given additional vaccine doses. Similarly, many other vaccine providers in our network are also prepared to increase their vaccination capacity as supplies increase. We do urge patients among all out there who are understandably extremely eager to be vaccinated. Please know that we're working with our partners uh, to get that done as quickly as possible. And beginning on April 15th, all persons 16 and over become eligible for vaccination in LA County. About 16% of those in the age group 16 to 29 and about 26% of those in the age group 30 to 49 have been vaccinated so far. And that means we have millions more people that will be wanting to get vaccinated. And again, it will take us some time to meet this demand. I do wanna also note that uh, we, are, we have already improved language access at all of our county sites. Uh, Public Health identified that one of our translation companies is able to provide video and audio translation of ASL and other languages. And our team has tested this capacity and we're in the process of purchasing tablets that can be used at all of our sites to improve the experience for persons coming to the, uh, the vaccination sites who need interpretation services. Uh, for uh, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to offer 
uh, all of our clients and our staff the opportunity to either choose between an audio or a vid video translation through this service. For the video experience, the system connects with a certified translator who appears on the device screen and interprets for the staff and for the client. Because it's a video interface, translators uh, from around the world are used, often with native speaking skills that are far better than some of the translators we've hired in person. Public Health has an account and a licenses have been purchased uh, and that our devices are arriving this week. Uh, so we're excited that we'll be, offer, be able to offer this, we think improved experience at all of the county sites. I'll take the next slide. While gaps do continue to exist in vaccination rates by race and ethnicity, with highest rates still occurring among whites and Asian, white and Asian residents, we are making progress improving getting vaccinations into our communities that have been hardest hit by COVID-19. For example, as you can see on this slide, the relative percentage increase in vaccination rates from February 9th to April 2nd for those 65 and, 65 and older was 145% for Black and African Americans, 114% increase for Latinx residents, 109% increase for American Indian and Alaskan Native residents, and slightly smaller numbers, a 66% increase for white residents and 71% increase for Asian residents. The higher percentage increases in our hard hit communities are helping us to close the gaps in vaccinations by race and ethnicity. I'll take the next slide. For those 18 and older, the vaccination rates are much lower, but also steadily increasing. Although we see similar inequities in coverage rates uh, with gaps again narrowing. As we expand eligibility to all persons 16 and older on April 15th, we do know that the numbers will increase and what we're gonna pay most attention to is that we eliminate the gaps in coverage uh, we're at a critical, we're in this critical race. Uh, we wanna get 80% uh, of everybody who's eligible vaccinated as quickly as possible, but we wanna do that by prioritizing getting vaccine into our hardest hit communities. I'll show the next slide. And we do that in part by managing the allocations uh, here in LA County. This table shows the summary of our weekly distribution of COVID-19 vaccines by the type of site that receives the allocation. This week, uh, there's 391 vaccination sites across the county offering appointments with their portion of the almost 400,000 total doses that were allocated to the county. And as a reminder, this table does not include the doses that are allocated directly from the federal government to some county pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, and to the FEMA vaccination sites, nor does it include the doses allocated by the state to our large multi-county entities, such as Kaiser and UCLA. With all of these additional allocations made by the federal and state government, there are an additional 197 sites vaccinating this week that are receiving non-county allocated doses. Uh, I, I wanna note that this week uh, we received 118, more than 118,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, and that these vaccines are distributed across many sites across the entire county including hospital sites, our county uh, large capacity sites, city of LA sites, our mobile sites, and many of our pharmacy partners. This week, more than 100,000 doses, which is over 26% of the total allocation, went to our federally qualified health centers and clinics serving residents and workers in hard hit community. There was an additional uh, more than 50,000 doses that were allocated by the federal government directly to some of our federally qualified health centers as well this past week. Uh, 90,000 doses are administered uh, at the seven, will be administered this week at the seven county sites. Uh, the city of LA sites are vaccinating an additional 70,000 people at their six sites and pharmacies are administering more than 30,000 doses. We now have increased the doses to the mobile vaccination partners and we have 54,000 doses uh, that are being used uh, at the mobile vaccination sites. Uh, unfortunately, uh, while we're doing uh, so much better than we were with the additional doses, uh, we still are not receiving enough doses for what we have capacity for. This week, we had capacity to administer nearly 700,000 doses, uh, and that's far more uh, than we've received. 
Uh, and we're just hopeful that we'll continue to get more doses uh, in the county uh, in the coming weeks as we ramp up to our goal of being able to administer a million doses a week across uh, our county with our county partners. I do wanna show you that uh, with the next slide that we're committed to increasing the vaccination sites that are in the hardest hit communities in LA County. Of the 566 total vaccination sites across the county this week, 266 are located in the hardest hit communities. These sites are managed by hospitals, pharmacies, federally qualified health centers, community clinics, city, county, federal government, and our multi-county entities. And we thank everyone for their partnership and their dedication to getting vaccines within days uh, of receiving them into the arms of people living and working in our county. In addition, I wanna note that our mobile vaccine teams are deploying to the hard hit communities as well. Uh, right now, they continue to prioritize vaccinating residents 65 and older and residents with limited mobility. This week, there are 107 vaccination, mobile vaccination teams that are administering vaccinations at senior housing centers, senior centers, with our partners at faith-based organizations and with some of our community-based organizations. We'll take the next slide. As you can see by this chart, LA County continues to allocate a larger percent of our doses to communities with the fewer resources. And uh, we've also, uh, on the data that we've been able to run based on individuals getting vaccinated, over 40% of the individuals vaccinated in LA County to date do live in our hard hit communities. Uh, and we've seen increases in this percentage in the past few weeks. We are making substantial progress uh, in getting our vaccines in the communities that need them the most. But we do need to remain laser focused, especially as we expand eligibility on the need to make sure that our vaccines are easily accessible in hard hit communities. And for that, we're grateful to the leadership from the supervisors and our partners to ensure that we continue to do a better job reaching those most in need. Uh, and I'll take the next slide. Uh, and I do wanna conclude by noting that if LA County receives a weekly vaccine dose allocation on average of 576,000 doses per week, this is total what we get from the federal government, state government, and what comes through the county allocation, we'd be able to reach that 80% vaccination coverage for everyone 16 and older in about 12 weeks, which puts us at the end of June. Uh, and as I noted, we are gonna have capacity by the end of this month to administer 1 million doses a week. Um, and uh, we look forward to the partnerships that it will take uh, for us to make sure that for everyone uh, that uh, wants to get vaccinated, uh, they have easy access uh, to vaccines uh, at over, at you know, really at this point, almost 600 different sites throughout our network and that uh, we remain laser focused on uh, narrowing the gaps that we've seen in vaccine coverage rates to date. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide you with an update on our progress uh, on vaccinating residents and reducing transmission. And as always, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferrer. Uh, what we're gonna do is hear from Dr. Galley next, and then I'll open it up to questions from colleagues. So far I have on, on deck, Supervisor Khan first, followed by Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, Dr. Galley, your presentation, thank you. Yes, good morning, Supervisors. Thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit about progress within DHS with respect to COVID. Our four public hospitals are doing well and they have now almost completely recovered from the surge uh, that affected all hospitals across Los Angeles County in January. The COVID census among our four hospitals is down to 63. 15% of those patients are in the ICU and this is a 25% reduction from just a week ago. So the numbers continue to go down. Only 10% right now of medical, surgical, and ICU beds that could potentially support care for a COVID patient are now filled with a COVID positive patient. Our staffing is also almost completely recovered and with all of the state registry staff that we had used throughout the surge are due to finalize their contract term over the next couple of weeks. Also, all of the DHS staff who had been re redeployed to the inpatient units at peak, that was over 1,200, they've all returned to their home facilities and home units. 
Outpatient services are ramping up, though we are still not yet at full capacity of outpatient services due to the hundreds of staff that we have needed to redeploy to staff the COVID vaccination sites in operation across DHS and our various programs and facilities and units. With respect to vaccination, there's a set of slides that I'll refer to just to briefly summarize where we're at. Turning to the first chart, which is on slide two, Total vaccination volume to date performed is at approximately 115,000 doses. Our focus continues as it was initially in the pandemic, it was on staff. Uh, now it continues to be on vaccinating DHS responsible patients. And as of yesterday, over 66,000 vaccinations were provided to date to DHS and panel patients. That does not include vaccinations that are provided to inmates in the LA County jail system or to persons experiencing homelessness. And I'll talk about those separately. Slides two and three demonstrate the focus of DHS's vaccination efforts toward communities that have been shown throughout this pandemic to be most at risk of exposure to COVID and a serious outcome and serious course of illness with COVID. This is true both in looking at the communities that are most disadvantaged by the Healthy Places Index, which is shown on slide three, where 64% of patients, sorry, 84% of patients vaccinated by DHS are from the two most disadvantaged quartiles, whereas those populations make up just over 60% for the county overall. On the next slide, we look at a similar um, uh, cut at the data, but by race rather than HPI. And this compares the current breakdown in race and ethnicity for those vaccinated within DHS, again, among our impaneled population, compared to the data that was most recently available to the public on the racial breakdown among those vaccinated across the county. And that's data from March 22nd. DHS has been able to achieve this emphasis on the most disadvantaged and at-risk communities by focusing outreach on our DHS responsible patients, the vast majority, as you know, of whom are low income, work multiple jobs, aren't able to take advantage of telework opportunities that more advantaged populations enjoy. Shifting now to slide five, this shows the distribution of vaccinations by racial and ethnic group by age. The highest success to date within DHS has been on the Hispanic and Latino population, where 47% of those who are over age 65 and 19% of those over age 16 of our active patients who identify as Hispanic and Latino have received at least one dose of vaccination. The next most successful group we've seen is the is Asian population with lower rates among the other racial and ethnic groups and the lowest numbers among Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. It's notable that this data and all of the data that I share includes only those vaccinations that are given by DHS staff and facilities directly. We don't have, um, due to various technology limitations, the ability to do bulk queries into the state's immunization registry care. So we can't run a report as to which DHS patients may have received vaccines elsewhere in some sort of a systematic or bulk report. Rather, it takes an individual patient level query to be able to obtain and record that information in the electronic health record. However, we have done sampling uh, recently on a sample of 1,000 patients within DHS, and of that 1,000, 20% of the patients had received vaccinations at sites outside of DHS. Uh, and that was pretty uh, constant across various different racial and ethnic groups, different age um, cohorts. Um, and so we do believe that these numbers, if we were to look at the total rate of vaccination um, among those who had received at least one dose would be about 20% higher if we look at vaccinations from all, source, all sources. In looking at the next slide on slide six, this shows the same type of data, but by SPA, where we see that among those who are over age 65, somewhere between 40 to 50%, depending on the SPA, have received at least one dose of vaccine from DHS and somewhere between roughly 13 and, and the highest in SPA 7 at 22% have received, of those over age 16, have received at least one dose of uh, vaccine from a DHS provider. And again, if you want to consider the total vaccination rate among all providers, then please, uh, those numbers would be increased by an additional 20%. And obviously the numbers are lower among those who are over age 16 than those among over age 65 because they had later eligibility dates. On the next slide, we focus briefly on Housing for Health and the um, progress 
to vaccinate uh, persons experiencing homelessness, those recently homeless and the staff that serve them. So far, uh, the Housing for Health team has, per has delivered about 7,000 vaccines to date. That's two thirds among persons experiencing homelessness and one third among the staff serving them. Among the persons experiencing homelessness on the right side, the pie chart shows the breakdown in the sites in which those have been delivered with about 41% being delivered in encampments, 37% in interim housing sites, which includes shelters, 17% in the county's project room key and project home key sites, and then the small remainder in quarantine and isolation and permanent supportive housing sites and some other small sites. The next slide shows the breakdown by geography, by spa, and also the racial and ethnic breakdown. As we can see uh, here, the rate uh, of vaccination um, as compared to the uh, prevalence of the population overall among persons experiencing homelessness, it lags among Black and African American persons experiencing homelessness. This is due to a higher declination rate among this population. Um, Housing for Health team continues to work to engage with all persons experiencing homelessness to work through their various reasons for declining the vaccine and reasons why they may still be vaccine hesitant. And currently, Housing for Health is in the process of hiring community ambassadors who can work to be trusted messengers with these populations and help to overcome some of the vaccine hesitancy that we've seen that is contributing to this uh, disproportionality among racial and ethnic groups. And finally, on the last slide for correctional health services, uh, this population also became broadly eligible a couple of weeks ago. As of late March, almost 4,000 doses had been given with an additional 1,500 doses that have been given since that time. The acceptance rate in the jails among inmates in the LA County jail system is running at just over half, currently at 54% and the Correctional Health Services staff are working diligently to educate and make multiple offers of vaccine to the inmates in the LA County jail system. Uh, I will wrap it up there. Uh, I do wanna thank you for the opportunity to share these updates and for the board's ongoing support and would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Galley. We'll start with Supervisor Hahn, followed by Supervisor Q. Supervisor Hahn. Oh, hi. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Kelly. I thought uh, Dr. Sharon was going to present. That's why I was uh, hesitant right there. No, we're um, going to take the questions for these two first, and then we'll take questions for the next Okay. One. Great. Perfect. Um, thanks to both of you again for, you know, all you're doing. Uh, I, apparently, the governor just announced that uh, he's unveiling a new green tier uh, that we could be all in by June 15th. Uh, and I know that's a ways away, but I certainly think, uh, you know, for all of us, that's what we've been waiting for. That's what we've been following all these guidelines for. That's why we made all these tough decisions last year. You know, unfortunately having to close business down and putting severe restrictions on uh, those uh, people whose livelihoods depended on our decision. So this is good news. Um, do you uh, have any information, uh, Dr. Frere, on um, what this new tier will look like? I mean, is it really green as go? Like no more restrictions? Everything's, our entire economy is opened up. We can go back to quote being normal. Um, what's your sense, and I know you're, you're going to answer uh, certainly with um, the concern about the variants. And I'm pretty sure, you know, the state is looking at the variants as they're unveiling this green tier. But this really seems, again, this is the huge light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't know much more um, than what's been reported uh, about the green tier. I, I think it is really exciting. It's something that we all, you know, desperately want to uh, look forward to. And, and uh, you know, I, I think for everyone, the notion really is as, as more and more people get vaccinated, it becomes safer and safer for us to resume more of our normal activities. I, I would say, I think the, the governor, you know, has said, you know, we aim for June 15th. Uh, some of it does depend, of course, on our case rates uh, remaining relatively low. 
and our vaccination rates continuing to, you know, sort of accelerate in terms of the percentage of people that are, are getting vaccinated uh, and making sure in particular that vaccines are getting into the hardest hit communities. Uh, but I do think uh, the governor is looking forward to a time where um, we will be able to have reopenings at businesses with many less uh, restrictions. And I think this is particularly true around capacity limits um, and you know some of the, the uh, sort of inf regulations around the, the permitted activities. What I think everybody uh, probably needs to keep in mind is that given that there still will be a significant number of people not vaccinated, particularly we won't have vaccinated uh, many of our children yet. Um, there will be places where people are going to still need to be wearing their face coverings and keeping their distance. Uh, but I think the effort is one to really think that many of the restrictions that we have in place right now, many of the safety modifications that we have in place right now, uh, really aren't as necessary when you have uh, the vast majority of people vaccinated and you're approaching what we all, you know, talk about, you know, a herd immunity. And um, we're going to particularly pay attention to hospitalizations because uh, if you start seeing lots of people vaccinated and hospitalizations go up, you've got a problem. So I, I think it, it's all going to be done, you know, paying attention to what are our numbers. But the goal is exactly what you described, you know, to have us be able to have as many places reopened with as few restrictions as it makes sense uh, as we continue, obviously, uh, to acknowledge that in some settings there's more risk than others and we may require some of those modifications, particularly around masking and distancing, um, depending right. on which population right. group is there. I, I bring out schools because we all know that we're not going to be able to have, you know, certainly our youngest students won't be vaccinated uh, for a while. and. And even, you know, we're still waiting results from trials for, for younger teens. So so we have a ways to go there. Right. And I and I agree. And I, I do think uh, collectively uh, as a society, there are things that I think the majority of people uh, would sort of want to remain in place. And I think this is really where we move to a harm reduction um, uh, philosophy that yes, you know, there are certain things we can do now, but here's how we recommend that you do it safely. Like, I think the majority of people are gonna wanna keep uh, the outdoor dining um, priorities around our restaurants. And I know a lot of cities really uh, moved quickly to permit, you know, little parklets and, you know, removing some parking spaces and streets to allow outdoor dining and you know I'm hoping that we can sort of support that going forward um, and there's just other things I think people are going to feel okay about doing long term uh, again especially with variants hanging out there like they are um, speaking of vaccines um, Dr. Freer I know um, one of the charts is the 4.5 million first doses so far I'm wondering how many of those are the J and J, so they're done because first doses to me uh, signifies there's a second dose, um, or is that a different number of that? No, no. I I, I, I want to make sure I, I don't misspeak, um, but I think the the number of the total number of J and J doses I, I gave out earlier. Um, so I want to make sure I I give the same number. Uh, it might take me a minute to look to look that up. Um, but yes, it, it is. You're, you're absolutely right. It, it's one and done, and and we're excited about uh, having you know receiving more J and J doses. Yeah, um, I, I guess. Think, yeah, I guess it would be it would be uh, good. For... And, it's 121,000 doses have been J and J to date. Okay, so yeah, I guess uh, again there might be a chart, uh, and I know the public's not doesn't have access to to these charts. But uh, for me, I would like to maybe start hearing total number of people that are completely vaccinated mm -hmm. um, that that's a number that I know I've been looking and you're right it, this has been the game changer vaccinating people particularly in our hardest hit communities is the game changer and on that note um, I went and visited two uh, community vaccine sites last week 
um, uh, in uh, Hawaiian Gardens um, at a church and then another one in Lakewood at a senior center where we actually came to a senior center uh, and the, the residents you know, came to the first floor and got their vaccine. They didn't have to fight uh, with the online uh, appointment uh, system and it really uh, was wonderful to see again your staff out there our public nurses uh, helping to uh, facilitate these these seem like the way we're, we we should be going uh, less and less at the mega sites and more and more into our as you suggested our communities our pharmacies people's doctors offices is that the strategy you think going forward we're trying to decentralize a little bit in terms of of our, our vaccine uh, distribution yeah. plan? I, I think we're trying to do both still. Um, we, we have to work out uh, with the state and Blue Shield the onboarding of sort of all of the rest of the healthcare providers that aren't really in the system yet uh, to be able to vaccinate. Um, um, and in the meantime, you know, you're absolutely right. Like we need we need pop-up sites, uh, you know, as, as I noted, I mean, every, every week we add more and more mobile site teams uh, to be able to go out. Uh, but we also need to have the larger capacity sites because there are many people who can come to those sites. And obviously, uh, we can do a lot more vaccines at the larger capacity sites in a day. Uh, and that's helpful as well as we have millions and millions of people that are looking to get yeah. vaccinated. So I think um, the other strategy that I think is working really, really well is the pharmacy strategy. And, and we've been working on that since the beginning. The federal government has picked that up as well. Because uh, both between independent pharmacies and chain pharmacies, a lot of people, particularly people who are elderly or have underlying health concern uh, conditions, already have a relationship there uh, and go there. And some of our pharmacies have actually just been calling people and making appointments for them uh, because they know that they fall into an eligible group. And, and I think that's helping us as well. And often those are sites that people are going to on a regular basis, not that hard to get to. And as we noted a couple of weeks ago, we continue to work on our partnerships with transportation services and rideshare services uh, so that, you know, it's never going to be, uh, what we really don't want to hear is that it's a barrier for people to get to any place to get a vaccination if they don't have a pop-up site uh, because they don't have a way to get there. Right. But, the, you know, that that still is a problem, I, I know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but uh, you're right. And this, this pop-up clinic in this senior living uh, facility was was really joyful uh, to to visit because many of those seniors there was a 99 year old woman there I mean they have mobility issues they have transportation yeah. issues they probably would have never making it uh, made yeah. it to one yeah. of our um, mega sites so it was really great to see uh, again your public health nurses out there facilitating that um, let me just uh, add one more thing so it uh, again uh, the Appreciate your health inspectors, uh, you know, working with our businesses, educating them, maybe not necessarily uh, citing and finding them. And it did look like almost 87 to 100% of the businesses were compliant, depending on the type of facility, based on how many inspections you did. You didn't go right. to every <laughs> restaurant, every, but the ones you did go to, uh, it did seem like the, the vast majority of them were, were compliant. Um, I, I just, again, just want to, Thank you for that. Encourage, again, our inspectors to uh, really work. Again, as these protocols change, as tiers change, uh, you know, we really want people to understand the importance of uh, making sure that we're, we're doing this safely uh, and that we know people are anxious to get back out and do these things, but we all have to still uh, do it safely. But appreciate your inspectors working with our businesses and, and helping them um, do it right. So thank you, Madam oh, Chair. Yeah, no. Thank you. Supervisor Kuehl. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to echo the thanks to both of you. I honestly don't think people, uh, un until they read the book that's going to be written, I'm sure, really understand how many lives were saved by the work that you and your staffs did over the course of the last year. Um, diligently every day it took a lot of grief for it in many ways and uh, I'm very grateful uh, four things that I want to ask or say the first one is uh, just inquiries that I've uh, that I've gotten um, the first is 
a number of people who have been vaccinated have asked whether there are different rules anywhere for people who have been vaccinated uh, in terms of being able to go somewhere, be somewhere in greater numbers, et cetera. And if so, what kind of proof of vaccination are we thinking about? I think this is all maybe in the formulation stage, but I wanted to ask. Sure, it's actually a great question and, and it's it's past the formulation stage uh, in, in a couple of places. I mean, uh, the first is that, you know, there are a few places where we've been very visible about the rules have in fact changed for people who are vaccinated. You know, one is around gatherings uh, with, you know, sort of those informal gatherings where people who are vaccinated can gather indoors uh, with other people who are vaccinated uh, and not need to keep their distance or wear their masks. We just also changed the guidance for travel uh, and the requirement to quarantine uh, and or test uh, when you come back from travel uh, here in LA County for people who are vaccinated, obviously have this extra layer of protection. You're also gonna see uh, very quickly uh, a difference at some of the live, let me just make sure I, I call these the, the right thing, the live, the live outdoor events uh, that are happening. It's the first place I think you might start to see differences uh, between people who are vaccinated and people who aren't uh, might be at, at places like Dodger Stadium and at some of our other large outdoor event venues where they are permitted to create uh, what, what are called, you know, uh, sections of their um, audience, their spectators, uh, that will be made up of people who are fully vaccinated. And in those sections, uh, they don't need to adhere to the six feet of distancing requirement that's required elsewhere in the stadium for people who are not vaccinated. Um, so, so you will start seeing, I think, very soon, particularly at these larger outdoor event venues, uh, a difference being made between people who are vaccinated uh, being allowed to sit closer together, um, not have to do that six feet of distancing and have sections in their stadiums for that. Uh, and we've obviously then had to address the issue of what are the verifications. So right now the verification is pretty straightforward. You're gonna need some kind of photo ID. Uh, and again, we've, we've never required that that be government issued. There are lots of other photo IDs for people who don't have a government issued photo ID and some proof of vaccination. That can range from you've got an electronic medical record that was sent to you from your vaccinator site or your provider, or you have your white card. Uh, everybody is, is given a white card who's vaccinated. We tell everybody, you know, keep those white cards, make copies of them. You know, if you have a phone, take a picture of it, uh, because that will also uh, be the accepted form of verification. I mean, everyone knows that both the federal government and here in California are working on some other, you know, kind of electronic base system that, that people would be able to use, uh, you know, that really would link to a database. Uh, but that's not happening right now. And, and as you noted right now, for people who are vaccinated, they do have this extra layer of protection and there are gonna be some activities that are gonna be permitted. Uh, uh, as we move on into the April 15th changes that the state is recommending, you're gonna see more of that uh, for those activities as well. Differences in capacity based on whether people are fully vaccinated uh, or they're not. And doctor, um, there's also been some questions to me about studies uh, about how, whether or not I as a vaccinated person can still infect other people or um, catch the virus. My understanding is I am very unlikely to infect other people and I, but I still could catch the virus, but have a less severe case. But I'm not yeah. sure I understand all the most recent studies. Yeah. Well, that that's because it changes, you know, with every new study, because it's a small number of studies that we've had. But but you're absolutely right. Um, so the studies so far indicate, uh, and and again, these are relatively small studies. So I, I want to put that caveat in. But the studies so far indicate that not only do the Pfizer vaccine uh, and the Moderna vaccine, these are the ones that have been studied uh, most at this point. Not only do they give you a, a super protection against serious illness and death, 
but it looks like uh, you also have a lot of protection against both getting infected and certainly if you don't get infected, you're not going to spread. Uh, but that infection was for fully vaccinated people at about 90%, which means about 10% of fully vaccinated mm -hmm. people can in fact get infected and they still can potentially infect others. That's what's still unknown is how likely are they to infect others. It's definitely known that people fully vaccinated can get infected. They can test positive. Uh, most of them are completely asymptomatic. Some may have some mild illness. Uh, but the big question that remains to be answered is uh, if they uh, are, you know, you know, have asymptomatic themselves, how much can they transmit and how worried do we need to be about that? That's one reason why everyone still keeps their masks on and keeps their distance because we just well, don't have a definitive answer yet. Well, that's the point I really wanted to make is that um, everyone should know that even though they're fully vaccinated, uh, with the exception of gathering with their friends, you know, at their home or whatever, as you indicated. Who are also any, fully vaccinated. Who are also fully vaccinated. Um, also, um, out in public, there's really sort of two reasons, I think, if not more, to continue to wear the mask and uh, be cautious. One is, as you just indicated, the possibility, um, even though it's small, uh, of being able to infect other people. Uh, the second thing, though, I think is the anxiety level among everybody about being anywhere with people they don't know, like, you know, in the mall or places where we're not allow now allowed to be, and not knowing I'm a vaccinated person. So they see me coming at them without a mask, and it's very anxiety producing. Uh, like the gentleman that talked in the paper about not even being able to stay at one of the card clubs outside because he, he felt like he had to keep looking over his shoulder and see if anybody was getting too close to him. Um, so, you know, we, we need to adhere to all of these things. Um, the final two questions I have, one is in terms of the mobile units, do we have, is there some barrier to having more of them or is it just really finance. I mean, is there a refrigeration issue or anything that keeps us from having more mobile units? Um, I, I don't, I, no, there's definitely not, um, there's not a big refrigeration issue. I mean, obviously, uh, we've got cold chain requirements for Pfizer and Moderna, but we, we figure out how to do that in the field. Um, and, and you know, we've, we've managed that. I mean, obviously at all of our sites, fixed sites and mobile sites, we've, we managed to figure that out. Um, I think it really probably is uh, more a capacity issue and uh, capacity in a couple of ways. I mean, we need well-trained people to, uh, to actually staff the mobile units, but we also need good partners at all of the sites where we go. And, and so I do want to acknowledge that uh, we our partners are working really hard when we set up these sites. So as, as Supervisor Han mentioned, you know, she went to a site at a senior center and, and everybody or at a senior development and, and everybody there, you know, is working hard to make that work as well. Uh, so we have, you know, we have about 200 appointments scheduled uh, starting next week. Um, but some of what the limitation is, is, you know, we, we do often have to help people, we have checklists that people get so that they know what they need to do to have a successful vaccination site. Uh, sometimes we have to provide some additional TA. Resi you know, people who are gonna come need to get notified and get whatever assistance they need to be able to come down uh, to get the vaccination. But it really has been more of a resource issue. We obviously have more contracts out now with some of our partners that can help us more. Uh, and I think that's really the only limitation. There's nothing about the vaccine that makes it hard to do a mobile site that we can't that we can't deal with. Okay, um, those are my questions, and I thank you again very very much for the work. Oh, thank, thank you, Madam Supervisor. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Hi, I'll make this short, and I, and I you know, echo all the thanks. Um, you know, these have been difficult times, and I feel that um, we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and, you know, I met with the city of Pasadena last week and actually their, their vaccination numbers mirror ours, especially in the hard to reach communities. And so I know that, that uh, you know, we've got some work to do there, but I think we are based on the charts making really good progress. Um, one of the questions I have, I mean, I know that Magic Mountain has opened up. 
So we're going to be collapsing that super spot and super pod and making a smaller one in Santa Clarita and then looking up in the Antelope Valley. Um, but are we also looking at re at at um, more aggressive outreach in the rural areas? Um, I know we're doing it with the federal qualified health clinics, but are we looking as we get more vaccine, especially the Johnson and Johnson, really doing a more robust rollout in certain areas? Yeah, it's such a good question. Thanks so much, Supervar Supervisor Barter, because the rural areas are, you know, there's a different challenge there, but an, it's an equally important one for us to address. Um, and we are, you know, we are going to put up some new contracts for uh, getting some more community health workers to help us do more sort of outreach in, in areas that are, are less congested, let's put it that way. But, but nonetheless, we have a low penetration um, and we're working again, you know, with a strategy that has us popping up more mobile sites in rural areas, uh, finding, you know, smaller partners doesn't need to be a, a large organization that helps us, but something that doesn't have people needing to drive so far. Because as you said, we're going to collapse Magic Mountain into two sites, one in Santa Clarita, one probably Palmdale or Lancaster. Uh, we're not going to lose any capacity there, you know, we'll be able to continue to, to vaccinate upwards to 4,000 4, people a day with the two sites, uh, but it doesn't get at the other needs in some of the more rural areas, and, and we're going to have to depend more on some of the pharmacies that are located closer by and our pop-ups, uh, you know, our mobile pop-ups. Uh, we're, we're looking, uh, we've really been building out, um, and I want to thank your team for help with this, uh, our faith based partnerships as well, because uh, we're happy to, one of the best places for us to actually do pop-ups is at churches and, and houses of worship. Um, and so we've been trying to expand that. We had a great pilot in, in um, South LA and had, you know, hundreds of churches that we've actually been partnering with and, you know, having them, you know, combine their resources to sponsor one or two sites uh, in different communities. Uh, and we're taking that now up to Antelope Valley, and we think that might be a strategy that's going to make a lot more sense in some of the rural communities as well. Uh, I think expecting people to drive long distances uh, may be very unrealistic. So we're going to have to do have more sites uh, that are easy to, for people to get to. This is the other reason why we're we're anxious to get more Johnson and Johnson. Like for people who have a hard time getting to a site and who you know live very dispersed. Obviously, you know, one shot and you're done is it works so much better for everyone in, in those situations. So, again, a, a good use of, of a vaccine that's, you know, highly effective and much easier on everybody. Fantastic. And again, thank you for everything you've done with the Antelope Valley. I know you've been working closely and I it's greatly appreciated not only by myself, but by the residents up there. Um, and then my last my last more question slash statement as we roll out these new health orders you know i'm sure all of our offices get calls from businesses that feel that some of the um, guidelines are ambiguous or that there's consequences that were unanticipated so all i would ask is that we continue to have dialogue and where we need to modify or pivot as it relates to modifications to address some of the concerns in different sectors whether it be you know restaurants businesses um, that we that we continue to keep the dialogue open, um, uh, recognizing that um, you know we're all in this together, and so that's more of a, a statement than a question. But oh I, yeah, no. Yeah, and and I just thank you, and I thank you, Dr. Galley. I've talked to Huntington Hospital, and you know we are definitely um, in better shape than we were months ago. Um, and I remain cautiously optimistic if we all continue to to follow the guidelines and not let our guard down. Um, we can continue to make um, movement toward uh, the next tier and then whatever whatever the green looks like if and, if and when that happens on June 15th. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you. Uh, one quick question and we'll move on to hear from um, our other speakers. As we continue to reopen more businesses and expand vaccine eligibility, I'm wondering how, if there is a plan to target some of the younger and healthier residents that may not consider themselves to be at risk, um, when we consider who are more likely to patronize some of the new businesses that have been opened. That's a new, I think, population we have to have a growing concern about. So is there a plan? Well, I, I think, you know, our, our plan really 
remains very focused in terms of targeting for the next few weeks on targeting in hard hit communities, but in hard hit communities, it's targeting everybody now. I mean, as as I noted, you know, we've been piloting uh, at some of our with some of our federally qualified health centers and some of our sites uh, in hard hit communities, being able to vaccinate everyone to precisely figure out what those strategies are that really encourage uh, people in those younger age groups to come in and get vaccinated. I will say that um, as as a you know, some of the private businesses and some of the events move towards uh, really creating opportunities for people who are fully vaccinated uh, and the state issues more guidelines that really say, you know, if you're fully vaccinated, you're, you know, you can do this because it's safer to do it. Uh, my hope is that that also helps people who are healthy uh, and young recognize that there's an advantage for them to get fully vaccinated. I mean, the, the funny thing about vaccines is you know, uh, everybody getting vaccinated, you know, as many people as possible getting vaccinated is what gets us to herd immunity. And herd immunity allows us to protect those people who cannot get vaccinated, cannot physically get vaccinated, have bad reactions, et cetera. Um, and that extra layer of protection, you know, really, as you noted, you know, if you've got people who are now gonna be more likely to be going to restaurants and to be going to bars, and they fall into that younger age category, we do want them to understand that they create less risk for themselves and the workers, you know, as they get themselves vaccinated as well. Uh, but right now the target is really uh, to be very mindful of making sure that we're reaching uh, the populations in the hard hit communities of all ages. And I certainly appreciate that, that um, targeted focus. Um, I just, the question came up um, as I watched national news the last couple of days. Yes. Looking at states that are, have significant increases in there, and the increase in hospitalization are yeah, for yeah. populations under 60, and was really struck um, at really young populations that are now um, testing positive and being hospitalized. So that's why. <clears throat> yeah. I wanted to ask I mean, we, that question. Yeah. We're working really hard also for a strategy for 16 and 17 year old students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we, you know, we have to, they need to only, they're only able to get the Pfizer vaccine. We have a few challenges with that, but we're already trying to set up sites that are associated at schools uh, for 16 and 17 year old students. Um, again, you know, recognizing what we've seen a, a lot more transmission as, as more children are playing, children, they're not children, as more young people are, are playing sports and engaging in sport activities as well as getting back to school. Uh, and, and we're working with colleges and universities on their plans as well, because they also have, you know, the 18 to 24 year old population right. uh, that now, you know, starting next week can get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much to you both. We appreciate you and all the work you do. Next, we're gonna hear um, a presentation on the mental health impact and recovery for county residents from um, our Director of Mental Health um, Department, Dr. Jonathan Sharon, as well as Antonio Jimenez, Director of Public Social Services. Dr. Sharon. Hello, board. Uh, great to be with you this morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, great. Well. Uh, it's, it's kind of an honor for me to be able to uh, present to you about a, a look back and, a, and I would say a look ahead through the mental health lens and I'm encouraged by the light at the end of the tunnel, which is growing bright. That's good for all of us. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say that, you know, we've all read about it. We hear about this concept of population PTSD. Uh, many have written about it. I've written about it. I believe Supervisor Kuhl has talked about it at the board and the tidal wave of mental health needs that is upon us and we are seeing that and there are many many reasons there are multiple fears there's isolation there's disruption of routines uh, perceived loss of control confusion about what to do what not to do and a lot of sacrificed livelihood um, unfortunately certain subpopulations i believe are being differentially affected obviously kids uh, in the schools our elders are vulnerable are disenfranchised um, I would say that the, the fact that this pandemic has really impacted the human condition globally, uh, maybe this will uh, provoke our society to better support and resource mental health uh, as a result and a silver lining from this pandemic. Um, at the outset, I'd like to be clear that what I will say today is not meant to suggest that we have had many choices in battling to stay safe in the COVID era. And to this end, I really wanna recognize 
not only the board, but my dear colleague, Barbara Ferrer, who has been very courageous, a courageous warrior and saved many lives battling against an unusual and perplexing enemy. That said, in the interest of our collective mental health and well-being, I would like to challenge our county to figure out how we advance empowerment strategies as we move toward recovery and a new, better normal that is informed by what we have learned to date. On that note, it is critical to understand that while we must be vigilant about infectious disease risk to eradicate a stealthy virus, we must also recognize the even more stealthy threat of continuing to live under conditions where our ability to exercise choice and make decisions as individuals and a community, also known as our agency, is constrained. In short, living with limited agency can be devastating to mental health. So it is critical that we identify and engineer safe ways to empower the Los Angeles County Collective at every level and not allow ourselves to become victimized unnecessarily. My department did a literature review of recent studies related to mental health in this pandemic. And there are, uh, the bottom line really is that enhanced mental health is associated with empowerment, personal choice, purpose, and agency, which includes opportunities for participatory planning when possible. Certain highlights, um, empowerment has several components, including having a strong sense of identity and having a sense of being a survivor of the pandemic. Most most effective empowerment strategies include autonomy of decision making, having a sense of community and connection with community members. Effective approaches to healing a community include activating community leaders to reduce public stigma and promote shared accountability for mental health and addictions and enhancing knowledge, attitudes and collective efficacy in these fields. Of note, one report from 2020 by Caslow indicates that an overall public health response is optimized when behavioral health expertise is integrated within a comprehensive disease management approach across all phases. In terms of recommendations for healing and recovery going forward, uh, overall, I think we have to understand it in the context of a disaster, we're faced with post-traumatic injury versus post-traumatic growth as options going forward. And strength from adversity uh, is something to consider, not just in terms of re resilience from survival, but also through the development of novel routines of self-care, newfound purposes, and new opportunities to pursue them. I'd like to make a clear mention about our need to support and optimize the county family. The, D the Department of Human Resources dialogue series has been fantastic. I would hope that that will continue. Participatory departmental town halls, I think have been critical. A dedicated well-being line for all of the county family, which we have stood up, also facilitated groups, and certain tech-based uh, opportunities through Headspace and something called Prevail Health Solutions, which will deliver avatar-based treatment to uh, the entire county that the Department of Mental Health will be providing. Also working with DHR and the CEO, uh, the Department of Mental Health is helping to develop a back to work program to consider uh, many aspects of how we move forward as a county, including deployment of our DSWs trained to function as ombudsmen and to help shepherd safe and informed, organized return uh, to work. I also think it's important, and I know that uh, the board and CEO and departments in general are, are in support, but that we really, really think about the silver linings of COVID, and in particular, teleservices, telehealth and the health departments, and telework as opportunities for workplace well-being and for sustaining our efficacy as a county going forward. Clearly, we want to reach, connect, and care for the county collective as a whole. And one of the things that I think is important, which uh, has come up and I think was referred to uh, most recently here by Supervisor Barger with her comments is figuring out how the principles uh, of managing a pathway forward remain safe, but also uh, empowering. And one of the things that's been a challenge as we have uh, had to shuck and jive with uh, different uh, levels of infection and health orders is the communication around guidance. And just from a personal perspective, one of the things that I've noticed and that I've commented on is that I, I tend to get out 
I try when I, uh, you know, on occasion to surf really early in the morning. And what I sometimes see are people running on the beach double masked without anyone in sight. And I, I wonder, and I've approached some of them to ask why, but I think that in some ways that's, that's emblematic of the fact that sometimes people have been, are confused and we really, really ought to think about how to minimize, mitigate some of that confusion. The other thing we need to realize is that uh, prescriptive and proscriptive mandates have to be used as sparingly as possible because from a mental health perspective, some of the non-compliance that we're seeing with health uh, officer orders is, ramif is a ramification of human beings suffocating emotionally, and I would say particularly in free cultures like, uh, like ours, um, and rebelling as a way of expressing their, their identity and their agency and longing for a purpose and belonging in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, on that note, with respect to the autonomy versus paternalism or choice versus, versus constraint uh, debate, um, I would like to point uh, out one, a, a recent panel uh, that I had the honor of participating uh, in with Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Duardo from LACO. Um, during that dialogue, uh, it became clear that you know, schools are approaching families and the school setting with a lot of flexibility and offering choice to families for kids to stay at home if that felt more comfortable to go to school if that was something they were comfortable with, or to do a hybrid and over time to kind of find their sweet spot. So I would say in that paradigm, there's a lot of learning and we need to think from a mental health perspective about how we take those principles and ap apply them broadly across our populations, across the opportunities, the businesses, the activities in Los Angeles County. One program that we are, uh, currently uh, implementing and expanding that I think is very relevant here in terms of recovery uh, as a collective is the Community Ambassador Network, which is not a volunteer program, but really a grassroots stimulus package and something that we uh, worked on going back to last summer uh, with uh, particularly uh, the, the chairwoman, Supervisor Solis. Um, and what we're doing is we're hiring, training, and certifying community members in those regions that are most adversely impacted um, over the past year to function as lay mental health workers who connect with those in needs, help them navigate our complicated systems, and in the process, build up career paths for themselves, many of them having lost their jobs, as well as uh, our future county workforce. Um, I've talked a lot about the importance of peers uh, in uh, this setting with the board. Um, activities that are of, by, and for community leverage the credibility and the trust of our neighborhoods, which is critical uh, for individuals getting access uh, to mental health care, but also to get access to resources across the health and human services. And uh, I would suggest that uh, these types of community uh, initiatives are an important way for us to also think about how we uh, support public safety through self-policing and in the process recover as a whole from the impact of the pandemic. We're, having, uh, we're developing right now a partnership with the Department of Public Social Services to expand and sustain our community ambassador network. And I'm joined by Antonia Jimenez, uh, my close co uh, colleague and the director of that department. Uh, and she'll be presenting in a minute on our partnership. Uh, we also think that leveraging the American Rescue Plan dollars to support a more robust Community Access Network over the next three years would make, a gr would make great sense as an investment in our constituents as a core part of the solution. The last thing I'll mention is the importance of, commu of community capacity building and the arts and creativity as a way uh, to heal and to connect. Um, those, uh, many of, of you and, and certainly board members are aware of uh, the We Rise campaign, which will be coming to us in May as a part of uh, mental Health Month, where we use arts to combat stigma, increase awareness, and improve access, as well as to foster inclusion. Um, we have a great deal of support from the board, uh, from other departments, private organizations, as well as philanthropy. And I will state that the World Health Organization has even partnered uh, in the, uh, a global campaign that was initiated last month called Healing Arts 2021 as a response to COVID. And uh, 
that was based on a report that they did over many years, which showed that uh, arts and uh, and activities um, around uh, festivals around arts decrease isolation, reach many of those who are hardest to engage, increase social cohesion by bridging communities, and prompt those in need to get help. And along those lines, I want to recognize Kristen Sakota, who has, uh, with CARES Act money, uh, supported a, an arts grant program, as well as the Parsons Foundation and Wendy Guerin, who have uh, done a massive amount of uh, fundraising around capacity building for arts uh, community and organizations throughout uh, LA County. Um, Without going further uh, around access to care and the many, many things that we're doing to drive people to get services uh, and to provide air traffic control to those who reach out to us, uh, to having massive amounts of information online for help uh, as a directory for people in need or uh, interested in what help is available, the tech-based solutions, our call line with increased capacity for real-time emotional support, as well as information and referral, uh, and includes uh, access for veterans specifically. I think I'll hand it over to my colleague, Antonia. I really appreciate the opportunity to present here, and I would love to participate more and more in this recovery effort. Uh, Antonia, take it away. Great. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, good afternoon, members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm always grateful when I have an opportunity to present. Um, to you. I believe that DPSS plays a critical role in helping to jumpstart the economy for our DPSS customers post-pandemic. To that end, we've been doing everything we can to ensure that our CalWORKs recipients have every opportunity available to them to secure employment that will enable them to move up the economic mobility scale. As you know, our CalWORKs families are the poorest of the poor, so our commitment to support them is stronger now more than ever. You know, we've done a lot of support for them, even by offering tutoring services to CalWORKs families so that students are able to maintain their academic status. With this Community Ambassador Network endeavor, we're collaborating with DMH to provide opportunities for our CalWORKs families to serve as what we're calling community ambassadors. As community ambassadors interns, they will engage with residents in their community to serve the goal of improving their collective emotional physical and spiritual well-being. Activities will include outreach and engagement in areas such as social determinants of health and the COVID-19 recovery uh, tra uh, trauma. Uh, we're targeting to start with 50 slots for CalWORKs game participants who have been referred to DMH or are participating in a DMH individual placement and supportive employment program and the placements will be with the existing DMH innovations contractor providers. Um, we will subsidize their employment for 12 months at a rate of $15 an hour, and we will pay that through our CalWORKs single allocation of dollars. So upon completion of the training, these individuals will be assigned and certified and we will become trainees of the community ambassador program. Our recruitment into this program will begin on May 2021, 20, and depending on the progress, we might act, include in, increase the target population from 50 to higher, but this is our pilot program. So this is one of the programs that we're doing to ensure the holistic well-being of our CalWORKs families, not only on the health side, but also on the economic well-being side. So I'll keep it short, sweet, and succinct, and just say, if you have any questions, I'm available to respond. Thank you very much. Supervisor Barger. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate this report. And, you know, one of the things, uh, Dr. Sharon, you know that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And I think we have an opportunity to work in conjunction with public health and with DPSS to really heighten awareness surrounding the challenges facing people. I mean, we talked about food insecurity and the, the issues that families have had to face. And there's no question in my mind that as we reopen, we have a lot of work to do um, on the mental health side as it relates to um, just allowing people to feel comfortable coming back into um, 
work or going out um, doing things that pre-COVID were the norm, which now people are afraid. And so I, I, I'm, I appreciate your report. I hope that moving forward, um, we can make great strides um, to educate people, to break the stigma as it relates to mental health, um, uh, that it's not just schizophrenic, bipolar, it can be depression, um, and that we you know, are in this together and do a lot of outreach into communities, especially with our youth because one of the areas when I, again, met with the city of Pasadena last week that was brought up was mental health surrounding children, especially going back to school. So I think we have an opportunity to work with school districts as well um, to roll that out and work with public health um, because this, this is a public health crisis um, as it relates to the, the, the mental health challenges facing people in LA County, but actually throughout the world. So I wanna thank you for your report and I look forward to working together and, and using May as a platform uh, to address, you know, the issues, and I'm interested in the we were right or the um, the uh, the I just said we rise um, that is moving forward um, because I think there is an opportunity there as well because we all know that arts is a way to really help people express themselves, especially in times of crisis. So I just want to thank you very much for your report and thank you. Antonia, you are doing an amazing job helping the most in need in LA County, and we appreciate everything you and your staff do. Thank you. Supervisor, Supervisor Hahn, you have a question for Dr. Sharon? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sharon, for that report. And really listening to you uh, reminded me of the trauma that people went through last year. 2020 was such a difficult year. If you got sick, if you lost a loved one who had gotten sick, but particularly as you talked about the businesses that because of uh, you know this pandemic and no fault of their own, you know, decisions were made to literally prevent people from earning a living. And it would have been one thing if our federal government had paid people to stay home, uh, but that uh, never was forthcoming. So to listen to you talk about the trauma collectively that people experienced, um, I, I, I really was feeling it. And hopefully we can figure out going forward how to address uh, some of our residents' uh, deep personal loss because of the decisions that we had had to make last year. Do, do you have any suggestions on how we can collectively kind of engage those people who don't necessarily um, seek mental health uh, treatment? I will, you know, this is a great question. I, you know, I want to reiterate my introduction where I, I don't believe we had, uh, have had a lot of choices. And I, I think that this board and, and uh, you know, and Barbara in particular, um, uh, you know, uh, did the things that we needed to do to, to, to save lives. Um, the, uh, the impact long term, um, not just for mental health, but for addictions is, uh, is going to be significant. Um, I, and I, I believe we'll lag. Um, what we can do is continue to press out as much messaging as possible um, to, to get people to understand um, you know, what, what, what's happened and why they may be feeling the mm -hmm. way they feel or why others are feeling the way that they're mm -hmm. feeling to, to kind of uh, process the, the, the trauma, as I was saying, and look for ways uh, through empowerment to, to grow from the trauma as opposed to being injured mm -hmm. by the trauma. And I think that's why you're pulling me in now uh, and why going forward, we really, really have to pull, we have to be thinking through that lens of psychological trauma as mm -hmm. core uh, to the recovery of individual people, of families, of neighborhoods, of our community, of our businesses, of our schools across the mm -hmm. board. Yeah, and maybe we st I mean, maybe we r reach out to our our typical uh, business type associations like chambers again that we don't typically 
have a mental health piece to um, recovery. Uh, and, and this might be something I'd love to work with you on and, and some of my chambers in my area who, again, typically are not touching on that aspect of uh, recovery. It's mainly fin financial and how do you get your business back open and, you know, and, and this is such an important piece because I do know, and you're right, we did not have choices. We were doing what we could to save lives, but people were traumatized who lost their businesses, lost their livelihoods, lost their jobs and had no way to uh, recover. You know, you mentioned how we need to maybe get to a better uh, normal. And I like the way you said that because everybody's been talking about getting back to some sense of normalcy, but we could, this is an opportunity to have a better normal. And one of the things I was thinking about is uh, your department has provided many of your services virtually uh, as opposed to in person and wondering and there, you probably would be the first to admit that maybe a lot of people did better virtually anyway, uh, as opposed to seeking in-person uh, services. Is this something that you think your department will continue to do, offering people the option to choose uh, virtual um, uh, meetings or, or services as opposed to in-person, if, if that works better for them? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I go back to the paradigm of the schools and my, the, the panel that I had with uh, uh, with, with Drs. Eduardo and Ferrer and, and, and the importance of choice. Um, we have moved, we went from under, we went from about 10 to 15% telehealth to over 80% telehealth over the course of a month. Um, what we found is that we're actually connecting with more people. We have more unique clients and that customer satisfaction has gone up for many, not all. Um, so we absolutely are going to continue doing men uh, tele mental health, and we're lobbying hard at the state and federal level to make sure that um, those services are reimbursed. You know, it's kind of like, oh, we're going to do you a favor by reimbursing you during the pandemic, but no, we're actually redefining access uh, and customer service. So please uh, reimburse that, and we'll have to study the uh, the efficacy of these types of treatments over time. But you know, all indicators that. Uh, at the current time are quite positive. Yeah, good, and I really liked your suggestion of uh, our, our disaster service workers actually being in an ombudsman ob role um, as we uh, begin to, some return to work, some keep teleworking. Again, I was pushing for uh, telework uh, two years ago uh, as a way, <laughs> we were thinking about it two years ago as a way to reduce traffic, uh, to maybe um, allow the county to get out of some of our long-term building leases that maybe didn't make any sense anymore uh, and a way to improve morale. Uh, so this sort of jump uh, warp speeded our tele telework uh, working from home uh, initiative in the county. But that also came with some feelings of isolation and you know people did miss the socialization of working together. But I hope we can uh, do some sort of a hybrid and I like the fact of uh, our DSWs kind of moving into a, a different role as, as we reopen. And the last thing I'll say, I know you and I had a conversation a while back about the, the idea of harm reduction and the idea of just instilling certain principles as we go forward of, you know, okay, maybe we reach the green tier, maybe everything is reopened, but you know, there's just certain things we should probably always do to engage in activities in a safer way, uh, you know, never really knowing whether or not, you know, some variants will rise up again. There's just certain things we could do to reduce the harm of engaging in activities. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate all your all your questions and comments, Supervisor Hahn. And, and one thing I, I do want to just say to reiterate a point is that while while our population has been traumatized, and many many people are gonna are gonna require you know, treatment, um, care, therapy. One of the things that will help the population is opportunity, um, is the ability to, um, exp to, to have choice um, and to engage in decision-making in a new way that will now be permissible, assuming that we're able to kind of follow Dr. Ferrer's guidance and the state's guidance around the maintenance of safety. And I just think we have to be careful about optimizing the amount of opportunity uh, and decision making that people can make while still remaining safe. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, thank you to John and Antonia very much because these uh, reports bring uh, an entirely new uh, and additional perspective to the kinds of uh, considerations we've been uh, engaging in. And one of the things that I was thinking among many, uh, some of which I'll share while John was talking, is um, although there have been a series of traumatic events that are much larger than just me in my lifetime, there have been very few where you were engaged in the traumatic event with every single person. I think the, the assassination of John Kennedy, for instance, when we were all out wandering the streets not knowing what to do or say, every person that you ran into, you knew had experienced that event that day. And this trauma is worldwide. And there is not, in my opinion, at least an untouched person in the entire world population. And that means every single person I see on the street, every single person I see on TV, everyone. Uh, and that means to me that we have all been touched in a way that we would not identify many of us as a mental health need. And yet things have changed so much for us. And I find in talking to people the things that we have in common that we remark seem unusual to us. For instance, I report to people, my sleep patterns have changed entirely uh, in the past year. I wake up almost every night in the middle of the night and I'm fine, I'm up for an hour, I watch TV or I read, and my friends say, oh, I wish you texted me, I was up too. And it's not, it doesn't feel like anxiety, it's just a complete change in what I don't understand anyway, which is sleep pattern. Um, the second thing is we've had some conversations among my staff uh, recently at a, a virtual retreat talking about what we would like to retain and bring with us when we return to uh, physically coming to the building. And people uh, tentatively say they don't want it to seem like they're not you know, working their requisite hours, but they talk about the ability to walk for 15 minutes in between meetings because they're home and they walk around the block or they've got their dogs or cats there with them. And that is something that they really value uh, and you know, feels more important than they do. But the more important, the most important one that I've seen is uh, has to do with the arts. Um, you know, we, we kind of talk about um, treating ourselves or self-medication in the case of sometimes in, in terms of addictive uh, treatment. But I think the arts have really stepped up in people's consciousness about what they need to feel connected to life going on and other people going through stuff. Uh, you know, we see Nomadland and Minari and recently The Courier, which many people haven't seen yet, and, you know, The Trial of Chicago 7. I mean, any of the movies up for Oscars. And I think even watching them alone, I feel touched um, and but kind of transformed. And I think that the making of music, uh, the making of uh, music that makes fun of our situation, everybody sharing uh, you know, 100,000 things on Facebook that they saw that some family in England made. The arts have really, I think, taken their rightful place in our understanding about their relationship to mental health and good mental health. Um, and uh, I, so I think we, we need to retain that, our understanding of that importance and continue it. And the last thing I want to say is about schools. Um, when I was um, in the, uh, maybe before I was in the legislature, I was asked to teach a documentary filmmaking class at a middle school. And I let the kids choose their own subject matter and they wanted to choose something they called the school machine because the school seemed to be very 
regimented, even though it was no different from any other school. You all have to sit in class. You all have to read the same assignment. You have to turn in the same thing. But they felt that it was an, a way that they were kind of robbed of their individuality because everything had to be always the same. And I don't know how that is going to change, if at all. Uh, if we will have choices about education, more choices. Um, and and also, I'm sorry, the last thing I wanted to say was I found out that you can't get any energy from people on Zoom. I mean, I'm an extrovert. I'm sure you're all surprised. And, you know, when I would do a panel or I would do a teach class, I would feel energized at the end because I got energy from the audience. I got energy from the class. And I was on a panel and taught a class last Wednesday, and I honestly fell asleep at 8 o'clock at night. I was so exhausted. And that has been interesting to me about the physical energy that an extrovert, probably not an introvert, gets from such interactions and how what a loss that's been. So thank you for bringing the mental health component into this and helping us to understand our common humanity and you know and some of the common solutions and thank you for letting me make a speech madam chair thank you very much supervisor kuehl um, for sharing your insights and experiences that many of us i'm sure share any final questions of either uh dr sharon or um antonio Ms. Jimenez, I should say. Any final questions? Thank you both very much for your presentations. Um, this report will be considered received and filed. Hearing no objections, that will be the order. Colleagues, we'll proceed now to item five on your agenda, the Los Angeles County Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, which was held by Supervisor Han. Um, Supervisor Han, would you like to make remarks? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to thank you uh, for co-authoring this motion with me. Uh, it's the escalation of attacks against the AAPI community has been such a heartbreaking reminder of how far we still have to go towards building a society where everyone can feel safe, be safe, feel accepted, and be equal. Last year, at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, we created the Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative. It was a response to the racism and discrimination targeted at Black Americans, but it's a framework to fighting racism in all its forms. In the months since, we've appointed Dr. Scorza to head the effort, and his team has already started this hard but important work. With this motion, we're asking Dr. Scorza to convene a working group made up of the Human Relations Commission, the Office of Violence Prevention, and leaders from the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities to develop ways that we as a county can address the violence and hate that we have seen targeting at these communities. This, these strategies, the strategies this working group develops should be incorporated into the anti-racism, diversity, and inclusion initiatives work going forward. This motion also includes an important piece suggested by my co-author, Supervisor Mitchell, to explore creating a county equity and diversity fund that would not only partner with the research institutes so that we can better understand what leads to this hate and violence and how we can prevent it, but also be funding that we can use to lift up artists from the AAPI community and other communities of color. I appreciate the support we've gotten for this motion uh, from not only the folks that called in this morning, but also groups like the LA County African American Employee Association that wrote me a letter committing their strong support for this motion and their strong support for the Asian American community in LA County during this time. Uh, Supervisor Mitchell, I know you might want to say a few words and then we could hear from Dr. Scorza uh, at that point or if any of my colleagues have anything to say. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Supervisor Hahn. Yes, and uh, I'm proud to be able to join with you in this very important motion because uh, I'm clear with increasing hate really comes increasing responsibility for us all to combat hate with the full resources of the county. 
And I certainly want to thank the work of many of the AAPI leaders and community members who are continuing to demand visibility and accountability, and we stand with them. Uh, I'm thankful that we see a growing public awareness of the historical and systemic discrimination against the AAPI community. Um, but awareness is not enough. We've got to take action. And frankly, I believe um, that we pay for what we believe in. So we've got to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, that's why I'm very glad that you were willing to um, take my suggestion in the creation of the LA County's Equity and Diversity Fund with an initial investment target of a million dollars. So it's my desire that this fund support the necessary research, critical data collection, the development and implement, implementation of policy actions to combat hate and discrimination inflicted upon all communities of color, including our AAPI community. So as we continue this important work in solidarity, significant investments like these will benefit communities that have historically been marginalized, silenced, and been the victims of violence. So I look forward to the report back and a specific actionable plan, an actionable plan to combat this hate in our communities. Thank you very much again, Supervisor Han, for allowing me to co-author. Dr. Scorza. We welcome you to provide some remarks. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Supervisors. Um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you today and for your ongoing leadership reaffirming LA County's role in advancing anti-racism as well as anti-hate efforts. I I'd like to especially thank Supervisors Han and Mitchell for your leadership on today's motion. You know, over the past year and since the onset of COVID-19, uh, there's been an exponential growth in violence against our Asian American Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. This has occurred largely because of very public and racist rhetoric rooted in harmful stereotypes about people of Asian, Pacific Islander, and Native Hawaiian descent. According to the Stop AAPI Hate Initiative, the rise in violent crimes has led to more than 3,795 reported anti-Asian hate incidents in the past year. The high profile shootings that occurred in Atlanta and took the lives of eight individuals happened alongside numerous reported attacks against our AAPI communities. A 91-year-old who was pushed face down into a sidewalk and an 84-year-old Thai native who recently died after being assaulted on his morning walk. Our condolences go out to the victims, their families and friends, and the entire community. Even here in Los Angeles, our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities are not safe from this type of hatred and bigotry. As you noted during the March 23rd board meeting, LAPD reported a 114% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes in 2020. Hong Lee, a Vietnamese American nonprofit worker in her mid-30s, described an encounter with a man who screamed derogatory words and told her, go back to Asia, after she declined his advances. She felt cornered by the man and remembered, and I quote her words, her own words here, asking for help, but no one stepped up. After a video of the incident went viral, she reported the incident to stop AAPI hate and decided to volunteer as an ambassador in our own LA versus hate campaign. She used her platform to encourage others to speak up despite barriers to doing so. You know, Hong's story is a sobering reminder of the discrimination and the anti-Asian racism that AAPI and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander communities and, com and other communities of color continue to experience throughout history. We also know that many more incidents are not reported and we must be diligent and ensure that the victims of hate crimes receive the protection and safety they deserve to bring these crimes to light. Standing alongside Ms. Lee and with our AAPI and Native Hawaiian communities, the Artie Initiative is proactively working to eliminate structural racism and build a more equitable Los Angeles County for all of our LA County residents. With your support, this motion will call upon us to do more to engage with our community to solve these issues. I'm excited about the opportunity to work with the Executive Director of the Human Relations Commission, the Director of the Public Health Office's uh, Public Health Office of Violence Prevention and the Director of Arts and Culture, as well as many of our relevant community partners from whom you've heard from this morning, including leaders from the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander communities to address hate, bigotry, and violence directed towards those communities. This will also help us build up on the board's eighth board-directed priority by developing a strategy that incorporates this work within the RD initiative, relevant departments, and countywide. We will create equity priorities that are actionable 
targets and measures to assess and monitor the, the county's progress towards supporting our most vulnerable communities, as well as identifying artistic and cultural opportunities to acknowledge, highlight, and celebrate the contributions of our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. In the moment when Ms. Lee was attacked, she asked for help from bystanders and she received none. However, the county is not a bystander, and we have stepped up by providing access to and support in the LA versus hate campaign. Now we must build upon that work and do more by co-creating solutions with our AAPI, Native Hawaiian, and other Pacific Islander communities in order to solve these ongoing challenges. Let us all remember that hate against any one of us is a threat and harm to all of us, and that we all have a collective responsibility to keep each other safe. Thank you, supervisors, for your continued support in finding all forms of racism in our county and for your leadership and support of our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, as well as all communities of color. Um, thank you again, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Scorza. Um, any questions? I haven't received any communication from other supervisors. Any comments or questions before I call for the vote? Thank you. Hearing no other comments, item five is before us. It's been moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Mitchell to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, will you call the roll, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Supervisor Kuehl, item five is before you. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero with Supervisor Solis being absent. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item 12, advocacy for state resources. Uh, I'll move, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl, to approve this item. Please call the roll. Item 12 is before you. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you very much. Item 42, a report on compliance with the ROSAS agreement. Um, I held this item, colleagues. Um, I'd like to call on Assistant Sheriff Bruce Chase and Commander Sergio Aloma from the Sheriff's Department who will present their report. Are they, have they joined us on the line? Good afternoon. This is uh, Commander Sergio Loma from uh, LESD. Good afternoon. And is Assistant Sheriff Bruce Chase uh, available? Or will he be making remarks? Uh, he, he is. Please begin. Madam Chair, I think they're not clear on the format. Are, are they going to give a report? Oh, this is uh, Assistant Sheriff okay. Chase. Sorry, I was uh, having trouble with my mute button. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yes, I know that they have been made aware that they will be making a report. So thank you very much. Can you much. hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Thank you. I'm sorry. Technical difficulties. Can you all hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry again, uh, thank you uh, to members of the Board of Supervisors uh, for the opportunity to present here today. Um, just to begin, um, for everyone, uh, this is a presentation required by the ROSIS Settlement Agreement to present current statistics. So uh, as many of the individuals of the public noted earlier, uh, every use of force incident involves a conflict between deputies and persons detained in the jail. So, um, this is merely a presentation of the uh, current statistics that we have in the basin facilities for Men's Central Jail, Twin Towers, and the Inmate Reception Center. So uh, there are no bragging rights and there's no victory laps intended in this presentation. It's uh, meant to be statistical. Uh, we should all want uh, the number of uh, incidents of force decreased in the jails, uh, regardless of any population decrease. Uh, and so it was brought to my attention that uh, you know, the overall force number that we presented, uh, a reduction of 28 percent, 
that there was a, a mistaken impression that that correlates to the population reductions due to COVID. Uh, our overall population reduction from 2019 to 2020 uh, due to COVID was uh, roughly 9%. Uh, and that takes into account the first several months of 2020 before we started depopulating for COVID, uh, as well as the last several months of 2020 where our population numbers were increasing uh, due largely to the number of state uh, sentenced inmates that we were holding while CDCR was closed for their own uh, COVID mitigation efforts. <clears throat> so I just wanted to start with that. Uh, so the first slide just outlines the areas that the uh, ROSIS uh, provision requires us to report on, the implementation plan, the status of compliance, uh, the training on the use of force policies, the use of force statistics and trends, uh, and the department's use of force, force, force policy violations. Uh, and then we've also added the inmate grievances at the request of some of the supervisors. And again, the data provided uh, for this particular report uh, compares 2019 and 2020. Uh, just to remind everyone, ROSIS is the federal class action lawsuit alleging a pattern of excessive uses of force in the downtown jail complexes, which again are Men's Central Jail, Twin Towers, and IRC. Uh, this, although the settlement agreement was originally approved in 2015, uh, ROSIS revised compliance measures uh, weren't approved until uh, the summer of 2018. Uh, so we've been uh, under those revised compliance measures since the, uh, July of 2018. Uh, there's 104 provisions with a total of 402 different compliance measures. So the next slide shows the uh, difference in compliance between the panel's seventh report and the eighth report. Uh, as you can see, uh, we remain compliant with all the administrative provisions. Uh, we went from compliance with 19 of the use of force provisions uh, to 22 of the use of force provisions. Uh, with the training provisions, uh, we stayed uh, compliant with nine of the training provisions in both 2019 and 2020. Uh, use of force reporting and investigations uh, is where we backtracked a little. Uh, we went from being compliant in 2019 uh, with 21 of the provisions uh, down to being in compliance with only 17 of the provisions. Uh, there are a number of reasons, and I'm, I'd be happy to answer any questions following the presentation or now. Just feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, the grievance provisions, we went from being in compliance uh, with 21 in 2019 to 22. Uh, restraint provisions, uh, we maintain compliance uh, with the two provisions. Uh, our early warning system, we maintain compliance with two provisions, and we're still uh, need improvement in one of the provisions. So in total, uh, with the ups and downs amongst uh, uh, the various categories, we remained in compliance with 83 of the 104 provisions. The next slide uh, goes over the custody force training statistics looked at in the report. Uh, our training numbers from 2019 uh, to 2020 uh, decreased uh, across all categories. Uh, and this was largely due to the uh, restrictions placed on uh, classroom and in-person training uh, at the uh, onset of COVID, as well as the impact of of COVID on, on all our personnel. Uh, so without going into each one individually, uh, you can see though that just going down the list, uh, we had uh, drops in the numbers. Uh, those numbers now uh, have started to begin to come back up. Uh, we transitioned as, as everyone did to more remote learning options and video classroom options. Uh, as well as uh, 
spreading out our training so that we could have it at various venues so we could uh, have in-person learning where it was required but maintain uh, distancing and, and other precautions. Uh, the next slide is the slide that talks about the overall use of force statistics in the downtown jails. Uh, and again, that's what I was touching on. Uh, I did note that, yeah, the 28% decrease there does not account for the population decrease. So we do need to uh, go back and adjust it for the population decrease. But although we were successful uh, for several months during the uh, uh, the height of our COVID mitigation efforts uh, and some of the, the uh, surges in COVID in dropping our population up to 30%, we unfortunately weren't able to maintain that. So over the course of the entire year, uh, the, populate, the average daily inmate population in the basin facilities actually uh, went from 8,077 in 2019 to 7,356 in 2020. And again, that's the average daily throughout the year. Uh, so it's a drop of roughly 9%. So we would need to adjust the, uh, the drop in total uses of force to reflect that 9% population drop. And you would end up with slightly less than 28%. The average daily inmate population across all our custody facilities for 2020 uh, was down roughly 17 percent. Uh, and you, as you all are mostly, or most of you all are aware, uh, for the last uh, several months we've we've hovered around 15,000 average daily inmate population, uh, whereas pre-COVID it was 17,000. But we are working all of us diligently. Uh, on alternatives to incarceration and other efforts we could do to, to bring those numbers uh, down again. The next slide uh, shows uh, the use of category one force. Category one is, uh, is uh, our level of force that involves no injury, uh, usually uh, just resistance and control holds, that type of thing. Uh, and overall incidents uh, decreased in just uh, raw numbers by 19%. But again, um, that would need to be adjusted against the 9% population decrease. Category two uses of force also dropped considerably. <clears throat> uh, again, although we're showing a 44% decrease in overall incidents, uh, we'll need to adjust it for the 9% population decrease to get the true number that will be a slightly lower. Uh, but just to reiterate, there's no uh, bragging rights or victory in presenting these statistics. Uh, each one involves an incident between deputies and the individuals in custody. Uh, and the ultimate goal is to always lower those numbers. Uh, category three incidents of force, which are the, the most serious, the next slide, uh, actually increased uh, from four uh, to five. Uh, three out of the five involved just the use of force that is considered serious enough to, ha to potentially cause injury. Uh, two of them were special weapons deployments on one of the inmate yards where high security uh, inmates were assaulting another inmate. Uh, so they're struck by projectiles, but cause minor injuries. But due to the seriousness of the actual use of force, those are also categorized as, as category threes. Uh, two of them did involve uh, broken bones. One was a broken orbital bone on a takedown, and one was a, uh, a cracked rib. So again, all these uh, uses of force are serious. Each one is individually. Uh, investigated uh, and the ultimate goal there is to to bring that number to zero as well. So the next slide goes over uh, force mitigation and quality improvement efforts we've been undertaking uh, and we have ongoing. Uh, the first
first involves weekly meetings with the division chiefs. Each one of the custody division chiefs uh, meets with, with their staff and the staffs of the facilities, and they actually review video of, of force incidents on a weekly basis. Uh, we also have uh, the Office of Inspector General invited to those meetings uh, so they can provide input uh, in, our, in our training staff as well. Uh, and this is so that we can immediately uh, take any corrective action that we see uh, might be beneficial. The employee review system uh, use of force component, we're currently in the process of developing a standardized uh, custody performance mentoring system. Uh, one of the criticisms in the eighth report was that the unit commanders uh, weren't necessarily following the same uh, path uh, as far as inmates who pop up on the early warning system. So we're going to standardize that. Uh, and we also want to streamline the reports so that the information uh, can be queried and, and more readily uh, provide us you know, useful information for action. We're also uh, changing the disposition of administrative investigation forms uh, so that we can have uh, the same type of information available to us where it's more easily queried. Uh, and also with the uh, inmate grievance uh, process, we're doing the same thing. So uh, it, the bottom line is that we're always, uh, you know, even though we're a number of years into the agreement, constantly working on improvement uh, to improve, uh, you know, the working environment and the living environment for everyone in the facilities. The next slide goes over the administrative investigation violations on use of force policies uh, between 2019 and 2020. So as you can see in 2019, there were 12 uh, cases initiated uh, and in 2020, there were 10 cases initiated. Uh, so not a statistically significant difference, even with population differences. Uh, and then in 2020, of the cases, 12, 12 cases were closed in 2020. Uh, one was unfounded. The other 11 cases uh, were founded and resulted in discipline to the employees. And then the next slide just, just gives an overview of the total uh, custody division administrative investigations opened. Uh, in 2019, you can see there were 110. In 2020, there were 107. And just for reference, uh, we included 2017 and 2018. Or 2018, you can see uh, 117, slightly higher than 19 and 20. But 2017, uh, 94, so it was it was lower, and so the uh, the numbers fluctuate again. Uh, just for information, not necessarily an indicator, uh, one way or another of of, of of any improvement or or decline. Uh, we've stayed fairly consistent, uh, trying to hold our people accountable for uh, administrative actions where appropriate. The next slide is. Uh, a list of the numbers of custody division grievances received. Uh, in 2019, you can see there were uh, 22,199 grievances processed. Uh, in 2020, that number declined uh, 17,710. Uh, and some of that may be uh, due again to population decreases. We would have to compare it. Complaints against staff uh, actually rose slightly, which was is concerning. Out of you know, even though we had a lower number of grievances, we had a higher uh, number of complaints against staff. Uh, and our iPad requests, uh, the iPads we have in the facilities that can handle uh, a lot of the informational requests that individuals have regarding their cases, court appearances, uh, and other various. Um, information that they would need uh, declined. 
The next slide goes over the top five grievances that we did receive. Uh, it remained, the top uh, grievance remained living conditions. Um, and a lot of this has to do with Men's Central Jail and, and the aging uh, conditions. Uh, and we've, we've discussed this and this is why the board, uh, you know, asked for the work group and the report that we just uh, finalized last week, recommending a path for closure. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the living conditions uh, at Men's Central Jail. Other is just a broad encompassing category uh, that captures uh, a variety of things uh, it, that we list below, visiting, television, work assignments, accounts, property, uh, delays, and just a myriad of things that, that individuals uh, uh, need to know uh, to, based on, on problems or issues they might be having. Male uh, grievances remain third. Uh, so, and they increased substantially in 2020, even though the overall grievances were down again. Uh, a lot of that was due to the restrictions on uh, processing and quarantines with COVID and, and things of that nature. Uh, staff complaints also increased uh, and, and grievances uh, requesting uh, uh, to know about their, their inmates classification, like their security classification or housing classification. And again, a lot of that had to do with COVID and restrictions on movement and housing that were in place uh, during 2020. And that uh, concludes the basic statistical information from the report. And um, I'd be happy again to answer any questions the supervisors might have. Thank you very much, Assistant Sheriff. Uh, Chase, I appreciate you um, being willing to come and present today. Now, will Commander Aloma be making a presentation? Or are you just here to answer questions, sir? Uh, I am here to answer any questions that you may have. Ex excellent. Thank you for that. Um, I, I ask that this item be held, uh, just really given the importance uh, and the purpose of the Roses Agreement. Uh, we know that it was. Um, arrived at to address the pattern of excessive use of force in our jail facilities. Uh, while I appreciate um, the efforts that have been made as evidence in the uh, PowerPoint presentation, um, I think the public comments made it clear and I would have to concur um, that we still have quite a ways to go. We have a long ways to go. Even while the 20% uh, will need to be adjusted based on the reduction in population, uh, and I appreciate your comments, Assistant Sheriff Chase, that that's um, uh, not a passing grade, if you will. Uh, it's clear to me and others, I'm sure that it's important that the department can continue to work in cooperation with oversight bodies, including the Federal Monitor, um, OIG, um, and the Oversight Committee um, to continue to enhance transparency and to improve the experiences of people um, within your care. Uh, we've asked both the Federal Monitor as well as our Inspector General, Mr. Huntsman, to um, participate um, uh, today. So I'm going to ask if they would like to respond to the report that was just pre presented, and then we'll open it up for supervisors to ask um, questions of both uh, the two of them as well as the Sheriff's Department. Um, Mr. Harris, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you. Would you like to respond to any of the data that was just shared? Uh, nothing in particular. I'm just I'm happy to to be here today. Thank you for, to the supervisors for inviting me. Uh, happy to respond to any of your questions. Uh, much of this this data we we are familiar with uh, to the extent that it, it related to the first two quarters of 2020. Uh, that information is, is uh, discussed in our 8th report, which I believe the board has. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would just say that, that uh, Assistant Sheriff Chase and uh, the rest of the custody division have been, you mentioned uh, Supervisor Mitchell, the, the need for transparency. I can say with the monitors, they have been extremely accommodating, um, available to us when we have questions. Uh, and I found Assistant Sheriff Chase to be particularly receptive to 
to uh, constructive criticism and other comments that the panel has had. So uh, with that, I will be available for any questions that you or the rest of the board have regarding uh, the ROSIS report. Thank you. Uh, Inspector General um, Max Huntsman, any uh, comments you'd like to make or do you just want to be available for questions? Hello. Um, yeah, I had a brief comment, if I could. Thank you so much, Supervisor, and, and uh, hello, Board. Uh, good afternoon. I, I've reviewed the report, the eighth report mentioned by Mr. Harris, and I share some of the specific concerns raised in it regarding uh, the way in which force is investigated, uh, dishonesty issues and whatnot, which I'm happy to talk about as desired. But I just want to say, I want to echo what Mr. Harris says, that uh, Assistant Sheriff Chase is a joy to work with uh, in terms of his accessibility. I think I think part of our uh, we do very well with custody compared to the department in general, in partly because we are also a federal monitor in the Johnson case. So uh, I think it would be unwise for the sheriff to to take the actions in custody that he's taken in general. Uh, but also, I think it's because of uh, Assistant Sheriff Chase, who's done a, a wonderful job of handling these situations. And I don't mean the specific force situations, but the, the monitoring process and the oversight process. But, but I still would say that all the actions taken by the sheriff to uh, avoid oversight and not to comply with oversight laws have an impact on our ability to monitor custody operations as well. As you know from the report, the discipline issues fold out into the internal affairs system and our inability to monitor that uh, effectively are being removed from EPC, are in, uh, being shut out of the computer system for the Sheriff's Department, really affects us. Um, but we did do a spot check on grievances because that's one of the issues raised here, but we did this some months back. And unfortunately what we found there was fully 40% of the grievances that we checked. We went into a, a module and, and talked to the uh, prisoners and asked them to share with us their carbon copy of the physical form they filled out. And then we went and ran them on the computer and we found that fully 40% never got entered at all. And I'm not saying that's true across the board, but it was true in this instance. So I, I continue to have uh, the grave reservations I've always had about the uh, record keeping and the uh, fundamental um, accuracy of the whole sort of re review process when it's just based upon uh, records provided by the department. With that, I, I, any other comments would be based on questions by the board. Thank you both very much. Uh, we will start with questions, starting with Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, thank you very much to the sheriff and the panel and the OIG for uh, working to continue to try and implement the Rosa Settlement Agreement. I know COVID did make it more challenging in some ways I'm encouraged to see the number of force incidents has decreased over the past year, but over the years that I've been here and hearing these reports, I honestly just don't think enough progress has been made. It's kind of like, um, you know, numbers are sort of dry, actually, just telling us how many of these and how many of those. It reminds me when I was uh, quite young, um, people may or may not know I was brought up Catholic, um, and so we would go to confession and confession would be like, you know, I took the name of God in vain. I did this 15 times. I uh, swore at my parents. I did this four times. You'd get uh, shriven and off you'd go. And it doesn't really say about how things get better. So uh, I want to ask um, Assistant Sheriff Chase and the commander, whichever uh, might uh, want to answer, um, three really well two two categories one given the seriousness of the injuries caused by uh, the head strikes and the alternatives to exist that exist uh, how does the uh, sheriff's department plan to actually decrease the use of head strikes so i'll, I'll answer that supervisor this is just the sheriff chase uh, and I agree, the reporting of statistics uh, can be a little dry. And, and so I'd also uh, uh, welcome some discussions with the monitors uh, about formatting the report to the board. So since this is a provision and, and the requirements uh, are mandated by the settlement agreement, I think we'd all be open to uh, providing you all a little bit uh, better 
uh, format moving forward that might be more helpful instead of uh, just the straight numbers. And then the second part um, uh, regarding the head strikes, we, we have uh, taken that extremely seriously and we've been in discussions with the monitor uh, and our compliance unit just had a productive conversation with some draft policy revisions uh, yesterday, uh, specifically regarding head strikes uh, and how we can emphasize uh, that they're not a preferred method of, uh, of either defense or offense in, in any use of force incident in the jails. Uh, and, and would be considered a last resort. So that policy change will be moving forward. It'll also be uh, given to the inspector general so that uh, Mr. Huntsman and his shop can look at it and weigh in as well. But we expect that to be forthcoming. Uh, and it's it's one of the things at the forefront of, forefront of all our discussions in force reviews uh, that we should prevent it. And having been one of the individuals that, that helped uh, usher usher out uh, the flashlights back in 2012 with that policy change and, and how much uh, of, of, of an impact that had in a good way in our system. Uh, I think this is just uh, uh, going to be similar to where we can work on it so that it's, uh, it's not something that's uh, relied upon as often as it seems to be now. I, I appreciate that. I guess my um original comments really had to do with uh, sort of the inability to see enough improvement, you know, where we see kind of the same report year after year and maybe uh, a few less uh, grievances, you know, get ignored or whatever, but it's it's not a major, uh, major improvement. Though I, I, I agree with those who have indicated that, that Bruce, that you um, have been very open with us and I think also uh, working toward change but it's uh, it seems to be very difficult and it's not just this law enforcement agency but you know we obviously see the difficulty in others the second question I have to you goes to what happens when uh, members violate use of force policies because the panel noted that the department's relying heavily on remedial training but not discipline so it's kind of like okay I, I can do this because all they'll do is send me to another class um, so I want to know kind of what factors are considered and who is responsible for deciding people are not going to get disciplined for violating use of force policies so um, and thank you for the for their kind comments, and I, I understand. I know we have improved uh, in a number of categories over the years with compliance, but we still, and Supervisor Mitchell stated that at the onset, it's not a passing grade at this point, uh, and that, and there are no, uh, yeah, there are no victories in, until we make uh, substantial improvements and stay in compliance. Uh, so every day is is it's necessary to work at that. But with the with the uh, use of force policies and holding people accountable, so we we did show that uh, 2019 to 2020 uh, they were very similar, and and we had 11 founded administrative investigations uh, that resulted in discipline. But we have been also trying to emphasize uh, training uh, where appropriate and lower levels of discipline. And I suppose the analogy would be with the pendulum. It's like, it swung one way, it swung, you know, swung back the other way. And we're trying to find a balance to where we can change uh, the culture, um, you know, permanently and, and get buy-in from, from the employees uh, that providing, uh, you know, an environment where force is used utilized, uh, you know, at a lower level and, and rarely, you know, provides a better environment for everybody. Uh, and so my, uh, you know, pledge is to hold people accountable when there's clear violations. That under the current process, it, it starts at the unit, unit level supervisors review the use of force, uh, and then it goes to the unit commander, the captain of the facilities. Uh, and they recommend discipline, which is reviewed by the uh, commanders and the chiefs. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, that's the system we have now. Uh, and and my emphasis is is to all of them uh, to take this, you know, the concerns you have, uh, as well as many members of the community uh, and our oversight bodies, uh, take their concerns seriously and weigh, you know, weigh the level of discipline that's needed to uh, to get the change and the buy-in that we want. And so it's a, you know, I I like to to say that if we treat our employees fairly. Uh, and they feel like they're being traded fairly. Well, then when they're disciplined and when they uh, they've committed, you know, some violation of policy, then it's like they have, you know, they've they've let us down. Or if we start, you know, at the highest level of discipline, and they feel like they're being treated unfairly, then then they feel like we've let them down. And so it's just trying to find that balance, where ultimately the goal is to have. The culture change, and we've seen significant culture changes, but <clears throat> we do have more to go. Well, you know, interestingly enough, you probably would find some support for that because this board has articulated, in terms of the inmates, that we have a care first, jail last policy, and that it's kind of the same idea. And I think it might be useful if there were any way in heck, as my grandmother used to say, um, that your own deputies could see the relationship there because they have not been really in favor of care first jail last for the most part but they do are in favor of that for themselves so if uh, this may not be an analogy to which you warm but i i think it may be useful to indicate that we do prefer education and you know, training and even treatment over uh, punishment. But of course, there also have to be some kind of consequences. Uh, let me ask Mr. Harris, um, the panel noted that the uh, department is con considering uh, changing some of the policies that the panel previously had approved. Uh, could you elaborate on any of those changes and any concerns you might have with the proposed policy changes? Uh, yes, I don't. Generally, what we're talking about there, uh, there was a requirement in, in the ROSIS agreement that policy that, that the, the uh, custody policies be approved by the by the panel, and uh, there was a, a comprehensive review of those policies, and policies were, uh, in fact, um, uh, were approved. Occasionally, when the department uh, proposes a, a change to that policy, for example, Assistant Sheriff Chase alluded to the fact that the head strike policy, or the, it's actually a prohibited force policy, uh, is being amended. They have to come to the, the department has to come to the panel to get our approval on that. So, we've engaged in that process where uh, proposed policies have been submitted uh, to the panel. We've made our suggestions, recommendations, and uh, sent those back. Uh, we've also, and, and this may have been referenced in the uh, in the report as well, there were, in the course of those reviews, we've um, identified certain policies that were previously approved, have not been changed, but based on our experience, we think uh, would be, uh, it'd be helpful for the department to reevaluate those provisions. And so while somewhat outside of our mandate, we've offered that uh, constructive, those constructive suggestions to the, to the department as well. So you didn't have any concerns about any propo actual policy change or change proposals from the sheriff? Well, we did have concerns. So for example, there's a, uh, there's a device called the RAP device that has been uh, used in some departments around the, the country and the uh, sheriff's department here has been using that as a as a uh, control uh, device in situations where there's uh, uh, inmate is, is has been assaultive or um, otherwise needs to be restrained. And uh, the, the department proposed a wrap policy to us as to when it would be used, how long the inmate may be kept in the wrap device, uh, reporting that needs to be done around that, and so forth. And we had numerous comments. Uh, about that policy. We went back and forth with the uh, department on that. And very recently we learned that the department had 
adopted our suggestions uh, and was implementing uh, uh, the policy with our, would be moving forward with the policy with our suggestions in mind. So it has been a collaborative process. Um, and on some of these, for example, on the prohibitive force issue that, that uh, uh, Assistant Sheriff Chase just raised, we've had very constructive back and forth and the panel has agreed that, that the department's use of a word here or there is is fine and we've sort of um, uh, sort of uh, compromised on, on the term on the language of the, of the policy so to your point yes we have had uh, changes that we've requested and in all the cases the department's either accepted them or convinced us that that uh, a different verbiage is is acceptable and appropriate um, thank you mr. Harris uh, my last question is to max um, uh, about uh, disciplinary uh, processes. Max, you've recently published a report, as I think everybody knows, on the sheriff's disciplinary process. Um, could you uh, talk about any similarities between the findings in your report and in the monitor's report? Yes. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. There's a couple of very significant uh, similarities and, and troubling areas. Um, First off, they, they identify, the monitor's report identifies a problem with timeliness of the investigations of use of force, and then with uh, insufficient discipline. Uh, Assistant Sheriff Chase talked a little bit about this desire to bring deputies along to feel that they're being treated fairly, and that's important, but we found in our overall look at discipline in the department that the, the discipline system is seriously broken in terms of its timeliness and in terms of the sufficiency of, of the punishments in appropriately cased, uh, appropriate cases. And in, in particular, the report uh, highlights the problem with dishonesty and it points out, uh, and, and when I say report, I mean the um, monitor's report. It highlights the problem of reports that appear to be factually inaccurate and yet do not result in discipline for dishonesty. And as you see in the report, they are very diplomatic about it, saying these can't all be a, a violation of our, our, our consent decree, but some of them bear closer looking. When we looked into the close details of similar cases we documented in our report regarding the discipline system as a whole, we saw the exact same problem. Uh, many instances in which the, the facts are downplayed, in which dishonesty is treated as though it is not dishonesty, and, and which you don't really have an evidence-based result. So there's a very strong correlation, I think, between the problems uh, that you're hearing about in custody, even though that's not a look at the same lens. It's a look at what's happening in, at the unit level in custody. But we saw the same thing as we dug in deeper into the discipline system as a whole, uh, but in, in have some very detailed descriptions of particular cases so that you can look closely and you in particular being a lawyer can examine the facts and, and see them. So absolutely, we, we see the same problems. We find them very troubling. I think it's absolutely critical to good discipline as um, Assistant Sheriff Chase said, to be fair to deputies, but that includes when they are dishonest, that they get disciplined for being dishonest. When they use force, it is quickly examined, and if they have behaved inappropriately, they are appropriately disciplined. That's a very hard thing for an organization to do. It almost always requires external oversight. We're very fortunate to have uh, a federal monitor helping, but as you know, our efforts to conduct the county's oversight under state law have been met with obstruction, not in custody specifically, but in the department in general, and therefore uh, we've we've seen a, a really negative outcome as a result of that. And I think that external review is absolutely critical to keeping the department motivated to do the best job. I think uh, I, I don't in any case in any any way question Assistant Sheriff Chase's uh, motivation. But he's part of an organization, and we need to keep the pressure on to, to do this best. Uh, thank you, Mr. Huntsman, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Kuhl. Um, I see that uh, Supervisor Hahn's questions were already answered. Um, I'll have a quick question, a couple, um, to give my colleagues time to reach out to me if they'd like to um, ask some additional questions. I, I, I'm, I'm struck by the last comments about honesty and accuracy and integrity of reports. 
Um, and um, if Assistant Sheriff Chase would just like to comment on that. I mean, I think given the importance of these reports in terms of really being able to track behavior um, and move toward improvement, it, it's how do you do that when you have reports that are willfully um, altered? Could you just comment so, on that? Yeah, so I'll comment. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And, and so just uh, what Supervisor Kuehl and Mr. Huntsman say, it, it's fair criticism. And I actually agree with with the uh, supervisor's analogy to the care first GLS. That's like, mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to have a culture where people understand accountability, uh, you know, is, is applicable to all of us, uh, not just the inmates. It's also applicable to the staff uh, and it creates a better environment for everyone. So, and then absolutely we take uh, any indications of dishonesty or integrity issues. Uh, the Sheriff's Department still has maintained in custody where we agree that someone has been uh, dishonest. Uh, uh, that's still a, an offense that rises to the level of termination. Um, I, uh, without, you know, having uh, specific examples of specific cases, uh, it's hard to comment, but I think the criticism is fair uh, from Mr. Huntsman in certain instances, and, and we work uh, with both he and the monitors anytime uh, we have uh, uh, disagreements or indications that, that we may disagree about uh, uh, the facts of a case. Uh, but all the criticisms are, are, are received and, and, and do point to the need for uh, oversight uh, and the benefits that oversight can have uh, so that there's, you know, an unbiased uh, third party available to look at, uh, look at things so that we're not just insulated and, and don't overlook things because integrity is not something that uh, we can, integrity issues or lack of integrity is not something that we can tolerate. I appreciate that response. A question for the Inspector General. You know, the report, all the reports that I have reviewed since joining the board show, you know, increased, albeit incremental, improvement and compliance. But, but I'm wondering if the methodology for doing that assessment may be masking some issues. You know, what are we missing in the reports? What information, including grievances, is not being shared with the Federal Monitor for his review? You know, is is there, you know, because it's the the agreed upon ROSA's agreement, I appreciate that we are tracking certain indicators, but is the methodology we're using preventing us from, from seeing, you know, deeper, more profound issues? Um, absolutely. I think uh, Assistant Sheriff Chase made the point very well when he talked about statistics being dry. In the same way, uh, reporting in a monitored legal settlement is quote dry mm -hmm. because it's just a, bu a bunch of technical benchmarks that are set up in advance by two parties who have been at, at odds with each other in a court of law, don't trust each other in that way, and therefore set up criteria by which somebody impartially can measure when certain things have been done. Mm -hmm. So by its very nature, it's very uh, mathematical and therefore mm -hmm. doesn't capture important things. I mean, the orbital fracture is a great example. We, for years after uh, Assistant Sheriff Chase did away with the flashlight, not only him, but, but including him, use in the jails, for years we had no broken bones. And now we have broken bones again. And that's deeply troubling. And no amount of compliance checks based on how many reports are filled out mm -hmm. or how they're dealt with would, would address that cultural uh, problem. So, so I, I share that concern 100%. And, and as I already mentioned, the numbers themselves are subject to inaccuracy because of the spot check that we did where we found 40% of the grievances weren't making it into the system in that one instance, it's very troubling. And, and the department uh, has always worked hard to make sure that its system of receiving grievances is um, airtight and can't be messed with, but it's, it's a hard, that's a hard task. The jailers 
on the cell have control over every aspect of a person's life mm -hmm. and it is very difficult for them to complain about things when they know the people they're complaining about or have control of things have direct access so there's a lot of methods that are used to avoid that but they're imperfect so yeah i think i don't i don't think a consent decree can ever be a good measure of whether or not reform is deep and meaningful it simply allows certain things to be done and then it's a measure of when you're going to get out from under the thumb of a federal judge. But it's never the standard that we as the county should apply when we're asking ourselves, are we doing as good a job as we could to protect the people who are in our custody? Mm -hmm. Final question for me, and this, and this may be a truly open opening Pandora's box, and let me apologize now uh, if, if it is. But, but based on your experience, what needs to happen to continue progress, particularly in the area, I think, of, of grievances, as you've talked about, just inherently how challenging that is, uh, recognizing that the grieved are <laughs> expected to file a grievance with those who, who, who they are expressing concern about. But um, in the area, you know, what can we do to make sure that the sheriff and civilians are safe and getting the care they need and, and, and through this whole process? Well, there are a number of very important steps and we work with the department constantly on trying to improve the process. So we need a, a willing partner, that's important, but more involvement by the executives in, in exactly what Assistant Sheriff Chase is talking about, communicating to the staff that re we really take seriously uh, these issues and we want uh, you to comply with them, not in a threatening sense, but in a supportive sense. That's absolutely critical, but then also in a, in a disciplinary sense that there really will be real consequences. So that's important. The process has to be solid. Uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, compliance with civilian oversight is absolutely critical. And as we know, in, in the current Sheriff's Department, we don't have that. We have aggressive resistance and that and that sends a message. The deputy gang problem, which isn't directly connected, but the jails are where that that, that was ground central at one point for the deputy gangs and, and the inability to really dig in and get rid of them is, is a huge problem because you have to trust the people making the decisions. Uh, my staff have uh, come to, I think, the slow conclusion that the, the, the deal that was made back in the day when the CCJB recommended body cameras for a custody and instead they were given fixed cameras that that wasn't in the long term a good deal. In the short term, it was a good deal because fixed cameras disclose head strikes. They disclose severe force, but they don't give you the audio. They don't give you the ability to really understand more subtle forms of use of force that uh, when a carry along hold is used in a way that maybe is, is uh, not appropriate. When words are spoken that are inappropriate, you have no way to know from the fixed cameras. So that's the, the same way we're rolling out body cameras across the department. We should do it there. Uh, and then there needs to be the ability, there needs to be full ability to talk to outside people. You know, the, the oversight, the, the importance of external oversight is, is can't be overestimated. You have to have people coming in regularly. The folks who are in custody have to feel that they have a, a means to talk to people on the outside, frequent visits with family, OIG, uh, more staff to be able to go in there and, and frequently talk to people. And then uh, as, as with the PREA compliance, the department has set up an outside hotline for reporting when there's misconduct and that's required under PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, the same, the same process really would, would be beneficial inside custody, the ability of people to speak past the department that has their, their safety in its hands. I can't tell you how many times since I've been in the Inspector General that we've had people come to us with concerns who said, but please do nothing, don't, don't fix this because I'm in custody here and they control my life. And then when they get out, they're willing to let us look into it because, because of their fear. Uh, so I think there's a number of things that can be done, but they require a enthusiastic, willing partner in the department. Thank you for that. Are there other supervisors that would like to uh, make remarks or ask questions before we move on to this item? Any additional remarks from the Sheriff's Department? Uh, I'll just uh, close in, in uh, echoing some of what uh, Max just said. So uh, an agreement 
that uh, we've actually had these discussions uh, with some of his staff that uh, regularly come into the jails as far as the body cams, the limitations with the fixed cameras uh, to catch audio and, and to capture uh, more detail. And then our concerns, because I didn't address it about the grievances, this, when they did their audit uh, several months ago, that, that immediately caused concern for us. So uh, that's again where, you know, the oversight coming in and pointing out a problem uh, is beneficial to us uh, because we would like to create an environment where uh, individuals aren't fearful to, uh, you know, report any adverse actions against them. And so, you know, the grievances against staff is one of our, one of our categories that actually rises to a higher level. So. Uh, and ideally, at some point, we'll have tablets uh, available to anyone that's left uh, in our custody, uh, where they can just do that, you know, uh, remotely from from their location and wouldn't have to interact directly where they'd be fearful. But, but anyway, I appreciate all the comments and and uh, and the continued cooperation moving forward. Thank you all very much. I think it's clear that we must take the Rosa Settlement Agreement seriously. It's why I held the issue. I think it's important um, that we not merely um, file these reports, but that we you know, allow the public to hear the presentations, allow board members to ask questions, um, particularly as we talk about grievances, um, uh, grievances around one's living conditions, feelings of you know, threat, abuse, excessive use of force, um, th those are, from my perspective, fundamental rights that whether you are locked up or not, you should have the opportunity um, to express um, a grievance. Um, and so making sure that we continue to monitor that process, that they are timely, that they are accurate, but that right is not violated, I think fundamentally is um, an important thing, an important thing for the Board of Supervisors to engage in consistent oversight with. Um, with that, in hearing and seeing no additional questions raised by supervisors, um, with regard to item 42, we'll consider this report received and filed. And hearing no objections, that will be the order. Thank you all for um, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, colleagues, we'll move on now to item A7. Discussion and consideration of necessary actions taken by the federal government relating to immigration policies, which was held by Supervisor Barker. Supervisor Barker, you have comments? Thank, thank you very much. You know, in 2018, when the board took action to address the needs of unaccompanied, undocumented minors, um, we had contracts in place for foster with foster providers. I know one in my district to assist with shelter and services. At the time, we were in a situation where we wanted to ensure that, that, that they were getting the proper care and shelter um, within LA County. I know that now some of these agencies are either no longer operating or do not have contracts with the county. And Supervisor Hahn, I know that, that Mayor Garcia said he has talked to you, but Long Beach is now um, reaching out and will be providing possible shelter uh, or temporary emergency shelter for um, uh, these you you uh, see children that are coming in and um, are going to be working with the county. And so I thought it was important actually um, for us to ensure that the programs that we had in place back in 2018 are still in place and the supportive services necessary to help not only the city of Long Beach, but we have to also engage in contracts um, to uh, provide the needs for the un un unaccompanied, undocumented minors that we have it in place in LA County. So I have a motion today uh, that I'd like to read in, and it's on June 19, 2018, this board took important action to address the needs of unaccompanied, undocumented minors, UUM, population in the county. According to that motion, as of April 30, 2018, DCFS had identified 72 children who were from Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. It is important that we receive an update on the efforts since the June 19th motion and that the UUM continue to receive the care and assistance from the county departments. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors direct the Department of Children and Family Services and the Office of Immigration Affairs provide a written update 
of their efforts pursuant to the board's directives of June 19, 2018, specifically reporting to County Council any children who were separated from their parents at the border who could be in Los Angeles County foster care, relative care, and where possible, offer assistance in connecting federal officials so the minors can be released into foster relative care while their parents are in detention. And number two, in coordination with County Council, to contact the U.S. Office of Refugee Resettlement and request permission to visit shelters operated by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to offer assistance to any minors that could be released into custody of the relatives in Los Angeles County through the Department of Children and Family Services. And three, visitation of shelters by the Department of Mental Health, Public Health, and Health Services where the children are being detained to deliver trauma-informed care and other services as appropriate and to ensure that all county departments dealing with this issue are delivering services in a trauma-informed manner to mitigate the impacts of trauma for these children as well as for their caregivers, families, and other county residents who may be impacted. And actually, I'd add that number three of my directive was something that Supervisor Ridley Thomas focused on, and I could not agree more that that needs to be included as well. So I would ask that this be a report back in two weeks, and I know that Supervisor Solis has expressed some interest in, in expanding on that, but I think that we need to recognize that with Long Beach moving forward, time is of the essence for us to provide all the supportive resources we can um, to these UUM children. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you very much, Supervisor. Supervisors uh, uh, that have any questions or would like to make remarks, we'll begin with Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. This is a very important um, aspect of what we started to try to do three years ago. Um, and the thing that has continued to concern me, and I don't know uh, whether this motion gets at it sufficiently, though I do support the motion, um, is what what we can do to understand whether the federal government is making sufficient attempts to identify families of these children uh, and not only those who've been separated from their uh, families at the border but unaccompanied minors i mean many of them have come or appeared to come on their own uh, at least they they appear unaccompanied at the border sometimes i think people think they'll have a better chance um, but i'm very concerned that the effort be made to find any family that they may have so we don't have to declare them to be um, you know available to be foster kids and then some family takes them in and you know it gets even kind of worse about ever reunifying them so i don't think that bobby's on the line today but i would really be interested to know what the impediments might be to dcfs even knowing about the children, knowing about who's there, um, and what more we might be able to do. So I'm not sure, um, Supervisor Barger, mm -hmm. whether that adds anything to the motion, but I think it is the spirit that I want understood um, because we have a lot of children in our county coming in that we, we actually don't really know who right. how many often. Um, and I don't know whether there might be a way to have a better communication so that we can be aware and help to find families, maybe. Thank you, so Madam I, Chair. Oh, um, so as a kill on number two, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and you know, I, I brought this in pretty quickly because I recognized in talking and seeing that what Long Beach is doing, that we needed to really make sure that the infrastructure that we actually put into play is still um, is still robust enough to support um, the number of, of minors that are coming in. Two, two, that was the intent of two. I wholeheartedly agree. I, I know that we can only control LA County, but from a federal standpoint, I think it is important for them to uh, try to identify um, family so that the children can be released into um, a family versus foster care, which is where they belong. Um, and so I, that was the intent number two, um, maybe not as robust as what you said, but clearly th that was my intent in, in saying to be released into the custody of relatives in Los Angeles County. So I wholeheartedly agree. 
Well, DCFS has really done a great job of stepping up their family finding over mm -hmm. the years. Uh, just in the time I've been on the board, we've gone from uh, something like 17% to 70 some odd percent of kids being placed with their families, which I think is a really good thing. So maybe if they do come to the attention of DCFS, we can rely on them to do that kind of family finding if possible. But uh, anyway, thank you, uh, Supervisor Perfect. Barger, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Barger, for bringing this forward today. It's, as you mentioned, it's very timely because uh, I was on the phone this morning with uh, Mayor of Long Beach, Robert Garcia, who uh, reached out to me because uh, the White House contacted uh, Long Beach and uh, asked for space uh, to provide care for uh, not to exceed a thousand uh, migrant children who are coming into this country. And um, he made it very clear that um, San Diego uh, was in direct partnership with the county of San Diego and that that is what made it work. And he uh, reached out to me to see how the county of Los Angeles could partner with the city of Long Beach in uh, just as this motion talks about providing the services that we provide um, as it relates to being a safety net for these children. So um, I was on the phone this morning with uh, Fizia Davenport uh, asking her to of course reach out to the her counterpart in San Diego to understand what it looked like. But it is, it's HHS will be running these shelters, but uh, they'll be coordinating in and also contracting out with uh, other organizations to provide these services. So we just want to make sure uh, that we hear from County Council, uh, our, the U.S. Office of Ret Refugee Resettlement, um, so that we can make sure we can provide the assistance to these minors that need to. So this is really timely. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Barger, for bringing this forward. Um, you know, it's not a, a crisis that is so-called on our borders, right? It's here, and I'm proud of Long Beach for stepping up and offering uh, their convention center to house um, these children. I, I believe they're going to be uh, up to age 12, uh, but the county has to be a part of this, and we have to understand our role in providing the, these services to these children. So thank you, I wholeheartedly support this. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thought I'd put two weeks in there. I was, can this report back, um, I wanna include it with this, a report back in two weeks, which is our next regularly scheduled board meeting. Such will be the order. Thank you. Um, well, such will, yeah, such will be the order once we vote on it, but yes, we'll make sure that that change is made. Uh, are there any additional comments on this agenda item? Hearing none, it's been moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please call roll. A7 with the report back in two weeks is before you. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll move to um, specials, item number 56. It'd be appropriate to hear from supervisors on items not on the posted agenda to be presented or referred to staff or placed on a future agenda. It's my understanding there are no specials today. With that, colleagues, uh, it's time uh, in our agenda that we will move to adjournments. It would be appropriate to hear um, from, we're gonna start with Supervisor Kuehl. The order for today will be districts three, four, five, one, and followed by two. So we'll start with you, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have one adjournment from the third district and then I have Supervisor Solis's adjournment, so I'll go 
with those after Supervisor Barger, if that's okay. Uh, I uh, would ask that uh, when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of musician Don Heffington, uh, who died on March 25th. He was a prolific drummer and a session musician who played in the uh, LA Roots rock band Lone Justice in the 1980s. And after that band broke up, being a, a talented percussionist, he went on to record and perform with some of the biggest names in Roots music, including Bob Dylan, Dwight Yoakam, Jackson Brown, Dave Alvin, Sam Phillips, The Wallflowers, and many, many more. Uh, he survived by his daughter, Laura, his son, John, and his stepdaughter, Desiree Buckman. And those are the adjournments for the third. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We'll now hear from Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Tomasa Pinedo, uh, who is the mother of my chief of staff, Gerardo Pinedo, who passed away at the age of 84. In the 1960s, she immigrated to the United States where she met her husband and resided in Los Angeles for the past 60 years. She was known for her strong work ethic and integrity. She loved to travel and consistently volunteered at schools and churches she co-founded a local food pantry serving families throughout the greater LA area. She was also very proud to have never missed voting in any election for decades. And she successfully encouraged all her children to pursue careers in public service. Tomasa is survived by her husband, two siblings, four children, 10 grandchildren, 14 great-grandchildren and two great-great-grandchildren. And I know this came as a huge loss for my chief of staff, Gerardo, and it was not that long ago that he was texting me excitedly when he had both his parents uh, in his car and they were at Dodger Stadium uh, being vaccinated. And he was so happy uh, to be um, able to be a part of that with both of his parents. So I know this is really hard for him and our hearts and prayers are with him. Uh, and certainly his father, who's also taking this loss very difficultly. Supervisor Hahn, can I, may I be included on that? I'm so yes. sorry. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Um, if I may be as well, Supervisor Hahn, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, um, I appreciate all that. all members, Janice, I really okay, do. Okay, thank you, let's do all mem members. Gerardo will really appreciate that, thank you. Um, I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Marilyn Shimon, who was a resident of Rancho Palos Verdes, who passed away at the age of 97. Marilyn and her husband, Bob, owned and operated LA Diesel Incorporated for over 50 years. She was an active member of the LA Harbor Masonic Lodge, the Beach City's Shrine Club, Eastern Star, Degree of Honor, and was very involved with the Wilmington Chamber of Commerce. Marilyn was preceded in death by husband Bob, and she survived by her daughters, Susan and Kathy, and three grandchildren. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Richard Mort, who was 75 when he passed away. He was the father of my aviation commissioner, Jeff Mort. Uh, Richard lived in Long Beach for over 50 years and had a long career as a bank vice president prior to his retirement. He loved to play golf, travel, but most of all, he loved spending time with his family. He survived by his wife, Jane, of 55 years, his daughter, Beth, and his son, Jeff, along with his four grandchildren, Tyler, Quincy, Aiden, and Connor, who were the joy of his life. I also move that when we adjourn, uh, we adjourn in the memory of Jeffrey Frankel, uh, who died unexpectedly last week. Um, he had just been elected to the Palos Verdes Peninsula School Board in November. Uh, and the district has been putting out statements uh, since his uh, passing and remembered him as a loving parent, a student advocate. Uh, one said he was an amazing community leader who happily volunteered so much of his time and energy for the betterment of our school district. Uh, he was known for especially being an advocate of students with special needs, 
uh, because his own uh, daughter uh, had special needs and that was his inspiration to begin uh, volunteering. His daughter, uh, Jillian, uh, was refused uh, participation in extracurricular activities and he uh, believed how that that was unfair and he wanted to fight not only for his daughter but for others who had special needs. Uh, he was a business consultant and he spent time on the district's budget advisory committee. He was also an appointed member of the superintendent special education parent advisory group and an appointed chairman of the parcel tax oversight uh, committee. Uh, one of his uh, fellow uh, board members, Linda Reed said, Jeff was motivated to serve by nothing but helping children using his knowledge of special needs students and the district's budget. He always had a kind word for staff and thanked everyone. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my adjournments. Thank you. Supervisor Bardwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Ruben Cervantes, a longtime LA County resident who passed away on March 22nd due to complications of pneumonia. Born December 7th, 1929, and retiring in 1995 from a career in construction, Ruben lived a very full life. At 91 and as recently as two weeks ago, Ruben still enjoyed traveling, fishing, cigars, Jack Daniels, and above all, the company of his friends. Ruben will be greatly missed by many who loved him, knew him, and respected and admired him. He leaves behind seven children, a son, James, who followed his footsteps into the building trades and is currently employed as an iron worker. His six daughters, all longtime LA County public servants, Anna Elena, Anna Laura, Isabel, Monica, Martha, Lisa, and his youngest and only surviving sibling sister and countless nieces, nephews, extended family member and friends. I also move that we adjourn in memory of Charles Dowd, a longtime resident of La Cunada Flintridge who passed away on March 18th. Known affectionately as Charlie and Chuck, he was born to hardworking family in Oxnard, California. He went on to attend Villanova Preparatory School in Ohio and distinguished himself on the football field with his barrel chested build and team first attitude. At Villanova Prep, he made lifelong friends with a group later referred to as the Four Horsemen, which included Judge William Clark, Pete Daly, and Jack Gavin, all of whom preceded him in death. Chuck played collegiate football for two years at Notre Dame and then at UCLA, where he led the team as co-captain in the 1954 Rose Bowl against Michigan State. His passion for sports never faded. He coached La Cunata Gladiators Pop Warner for 15 years and cheered on his children and grandchildren at countless sporting events. Following college, Chuck served four years in the Air Force, followed by the Air Force Reserves, from which he was de decommissioned at the rank of captain in 1970. In 1957, he met the love of his life, Anne Van Lahr. They were married three months later and enjoyed 62 years together. Chuck had a successful career as a stockbroker and was a staple downtown at the California Club and the Athletic Club. When not working or at home, he cherished the company of his horses. He loved to ride with his fellow cowboys at the Saddle and Sirloin Club in Santa Barbara County on his annual ride with the Rancheros. Chuck was a man who inspired others with his endless charm, infectious smile, and selfless heart. His kindness showed no boundaries, and he treasured family and faith above all. He survived by his wife, Anne, children, Riley, Robert, Stacy, Tom, Patrick, Peter, Mary, Liz, 20 grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. Also that we adjourn in memory of Jenny Edgar, a longtime resident of Glendora, who was tragically killed on March 25th at the age of 66. She and her dog, Sashi, were the victims of a horrific attack while walking by Lone Hill Park in San Dimas. Jeannie was an accountant for most of her life until her retirement. However, earlier this year, she decided to take on a part-time accounting position. She loved to take her dog for walks and was ecstatic about being a new grandmother. She is survived by her two sons and two grandchildren. 
She will be greatly missed by all who loved her, especially in the Glendora community. Also that we adjourn in memory of Dixie Iliopoulos, a, a longtime Antelope Valley businesswoman and civic leader who died March 22nd at the age of 84. Dixie died on what would have been her husband Ted's 96th birthday. They had been married 43 years when he died in 2005 at the age of 80. Dixie said in 2008, we always believed in volunteerism and taking positive roles in the community. Our lives were all about our community, even our business lives. They had been in support of what we believe in, but always in concert with the community. Born June 28, 1936 in Nebraska, Dickie, Dixie came to California in the 50s and settled in 1959 in the Antelope Valley, where she bought the Antelope Valley escrow. She operated the company with her son, Darth, from 1990 to 2001, when she retired and sold the business to Darth. Dixie was active in the Antelope Valley Progress Association, which became the Antelope Valley Board of Trade. She was a founding member of the Escrow Association of the Antelope Valley and Greater Antelope Valley Economic Alliance. She was also a founding member of the Lancaster Marriage Breakfast Committee, Children's Center of the Antelope Valley, and Lancaster Performing Arts Center Foundation. Dixie was a member of the Citizens General Plan Committee during Lancaster's incorporation efforts in the 1970s. In 2008, she was honored by the Los Angeles County Commission for Women as one of its Women of the Year. She sponsored tables at the county's annual Women of the Year luncheon for at-risk high school students who were working toward academic achievement and success in life. She also championed women through her Women Aware and Choosing Bible Study and Mentorship Ministry. She's survived by her sons, Randy, Darth, Gregory, and their spouses, and numerous grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And Supervisor Kiel, I know you're gonna be reading it uh, an adjournment for Ruth Schwartz, so I'll wait on that one, but also that we adjourn in memory of Samantha Minya, an Antelope Valley resident who was tragically killed in an attempted robbery at the age of 31. Samantha grew up in the high desert and worked as a manager of a Starbucks in Lancaster. She had been taking online courses to work in airline parts manufacturing and saving money to one day buy a home and become a mother. She was adored by her family, friends, and colleagues and will be dearly missed. She survived by her parents, Marcio and Celia, and her brothers, Matthew and Carlos. Also, Donald Leroy Thomas, who served 37 years in the Los Angeles County Fire Department, who passed away on March 9th at age 89. Born in 1931 in Baltimore, Maryland, Donald graduated in 1949 from Eagle Rock High School. He entered the U.S. Navy in 1951 and was honorably discharged as a quartermaster in 1955. After leaving the Navy, Donald joined the Los Angeles County Fire Department. He retired from Fire Station 84 in Quartz Hill in 1991. Donald was married to Margie Ann Meek for 52 years until her death in 2009 and then he married Neola Conway on March 7th, 2011. Survivors include his wife, Neola, children, Lori Bayless, Donna Warner and Lee Thompson, their spouses, seven grandchildren and eight grand, great grandchildren. And last that we adjourn in memory of Renee Balzet, a native of Santa Clarita who passed away at the age of 80. He was an actor, stuntman, stuntman teamster driver, contractor, author, and philanthropist. He worked for 45 years building and remodeling homes in the Santa Clarita Valley. His community service was rewarded by being honored as a Santa Clarita Valley Man of the Year in 1975. He was a creator of two movie ranches, first Blue Cloud Ranch and later Diamond B Movie Ranch. He was known for his enthusiasm for making the Santa Clarita Valley a destination for filming. In 2020, he published his book, My High Adventures Behind the Movie Scenes, in which he shared his many incredible stories from his years working in the film industry. His ultimate accomplishment was winning a Telly Award for producing the feature movie, The Long Ride Home. Renee is survived by his wife, Patty, and their son, Marcel. Those are my adjournments, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Supervisor. And we'll return to Supervisor Kuehl for the adjourn in memory uh, on behalf of Supervisor Solis. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Supervisor Solis, has uh, four adjournments. Uh, give me a moment while I call them up because uh, they're in my phone. 
Uh, first, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Julia Bogany. She was a well-respected Tonga elder, leader, and cultural educator. She passed away last month due to complications from a stroke. She was one of the most approachable, thoughtful, and endearing human beings to interact with and was an absolute treasure in the Tonga Native American and Los Angeles communities. Julia gave her time and knowledge and was always busy helping others, whether it was volunteering, teaching, attending meetings, or serving on boards. This past November, she was a Native American Heritage Month honoree. She worked for over 30 years with the Native American community, serving on the Tongva Tribal Council, and was also <clears throat> a cultural consultant for the tribe. She led countless Tongva language and cultural trainings and workshops throughout Southern California. Through her tireless work, she helped to reawaken and revive the Tongva language and develop a Tongva dictionary. Julia was committed to preserving her tribe's cultural practices, language, and knowledge. Her passion was driven by her desire to give back to her community and ensure a better future for her tribe and future generations. She survived by her husband, Andrew, four children, 10 grandchildren, and 11 great-grandchildren. May she rest in peace. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Marine Corps Reserve Private Jacob Cruz. He was born and raised in Montebello and was 18 when he was killed in combat during World War II. But he recently was accounted and returned to his family to be laid to rest. It was November 22, 1943, when Private Cruz perished. He was reported to have been buried at a temporary location chosen by his fellow Marines. In the immediate aftermath of the fighting on Tarawa, Japan, service members who died in the battle were buried in several battlefield cemeteries on the island. In 1946 and 1947, the Quartermaster Graves Registration Company conducted remains recovery operations, but Private Cruz's remains were not recovered. On February 8, 1949, a military review board declared Mr. Cruz non-recoverable. For his service and sacrifice, Jacob's family accepted his awards and decorations, including the Silver Star and the Purple Heart. And then on April 14, 2020, Marine Corps Reserve Private Jacob Cruz was finally accounted for, and after 77 years of missing in action, his remains were returned to Southern California. On Thursday, March 25th, he was laid to rest in American soil with full military honors. Welcome home, Jacob, and may you rest in peace. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Representative Alcee Hastings. Supervisor Solis says she was quite saddened to learn about his passing this very morning. He worked closely together with her in Congress, and she always considered him a mentor who took her under his wing and guided her early days in the house. Her thoughts and prayers are with his family and his community. He was such a charismatic civil rights lawyer who eventually became Florida's first black federal judge before serving in the House of Representatives. He and Supervisor Solis traveled on congressional delegations to Europe and worked together on many issues, including immigration. When he was elected chairman of the Helsinki Commission, uh, Supervisor Solis recalls whipping votes for him. He was born to working parents who were both domestic servants and stayed with his grandmother in the Jim Crow era in Florida where he was barred from whites only beaches and was bused to a segregated high school 30 miles away from his home. Against all odds, Alcee Hastings went to college and then to law school and was jailed six times for participating in civil rights demonstrations. He made a name and a career for himself in public service, passed away at the age of 84 from a hard fought battle against pancreatic cancer. He survived by his wife, Patricia, his three children, and his stepdaughter. May he rest in power. And finally, as Supervisor Barger has indicated, 
uh, she and I both wish to join uh, in the adjournment uh, by Supervisor Solis uh, for Ruth Schwartz. Ruth was 71 years old when she passed away quite unexpectedly on March 26th. She helped launch Shelter Partnership Incorporated in 1985 to combat Los Angeles County homelessness and has been the organization's sole executive director, leading it to become an exceptional service organization recognized widely for its efforts to house people experiencing homelessness. She was often referred to as a visionary leader for her early work on homelessness. She was relentless in a really good way in advocating for those whose voices are not often heard and brought their stories front and center. In 1989, she helped launch a warehouse project that secures large scale donations to be distributed at no cost to agencies across LA County directly serving people living in poverty. In the warehouse project's history, over a quarter of a billion dollars worth of daily necessities like clothes and shoes and socks and hygiene products have reached people who needed them most. Then during the pandemic, Ruth oversaw the distribution of hundreds of thousands of PPE to emergency housing sites. She never ever lost sight of what was important and continued to serve her community until the very end. She survived by her brother, her sister, and several nieces and nephews. And I'd like to add, she was homegrown in the third district. She grew up in the San Fernando Valley. She graduated from Cal State Northridge and got her MA in urban planning from UCLA and was one of the very first community leaders in LA to sound the alarm about homelessness. She was the absolute definition of single-mindedness, fully dedicated to people suffering on the streets. As Hilda indicated, she founded the Shelter Partnership in 1985 to develop housing and resources for people experiencing homelessness and served on many, many boards and advisory committees, including the Senate Bipartisan Task Force on the Homeless, the California Housing Loan and Grant Advisory Committee, LASA, the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing Developers, and was honored by the National Alliance to end homelessness, among many others. Supervisor Barger, do you want to add on? Yeah, I mean, th this one really um, I just is, is hard. I, I, I got to know Ruth when I first started with the county, and Ruth was never afraid to speak up for what she believed was right when it came to serving the most in need, especially as it relates to homelessness. She truly was a tireless advocate for communities that were often overlooked. And uh, most recently, she worked with my office to create innovative solutions for homeless housing and service delivery in the more remote regions of the Antelope Valley, where individuals experiencing homelessness face an extreme and unique set of challenges. I remember when she came forward and actually put together a shelter resource book that identified, it was basically a clearinghouse of all beds available in LA County. Uh, and when Corona hit and you know COVID locked everything down, she became concerned about the most vulnerable on our street and continued to advocate for the, uh, for the those people that were um, at risk of dying on our streets as a result of COVID. And so I I am grateful. Um, in my career, I come across people that truly help me to do my job better and be a better person. And Ruth Schwartz definitely, definitely, definitely um, falls into that category. She is going to be missed. And um, I know uh, that um, we are all going to continue to work toward getting shelter for people on our streets uh, in, in honor of Ruth. So um, God bless her and God bless her soul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Mitchell, shall we make it all members for Ruth? I, that would be perfect. I'd appreciate that. And if you would also add me to Representative Alcee Hastings' adjourned memory as well. All right. Very, very glad to. Uh, those are Supervisor Solis's adjournments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your willingness to pension, Supervisor um, Kuhl. I, colleagues, move that we adjourn today in the memory of a long-term member of the county family, Nuamaka, Patience, or Nuse.
Mrs. Ornusi passed away on March 19th after a long battle with cancer. She was the director of the Health Facilities Inspection Division within the Department of Public Health. Mrs. Oranusi was born in Nigeria and came to LA in 1981. She received a um, associate's degree in nursing from LA Southwest College. Her bachelor's of science in microbiology from Cal State University Long Beach and ultimately her master's degree in science and public health from Toro University in Vallejo. She dedicated 33 years of her life to public service, joining Department of Public Health in 1988. She held various positions in the Environmental Health Division before becoming the Director of the Health Facilities Inspection Division. She led a COVID-19 response that saved thousands of lives. In all her roles, she was kind to everyone and generous with her time and support and she made a lasting impact in the department and improved the lives of all residents of LA County. She will be remembered for her compassion to improve the health of all LA County residents and for her service to the second district. Mrs. Oranusi is survived by her husband, Victor, and her three children, Kene Chukwo, Chine Dun, and Chukwo Bukwa her extended family and friends, and her colleagues and friends at DPH who will all miss her dearly. With that, colleagues, hang on one second as I get back to my notes. We thank you for, uh, we'll take all the motions as seconded. If there's no objection to a unanimous vote, that'll be the action. With that, we will transition into closed session. So Madam Executive Officer, will you please read, please read us into closed session. Thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with Grant Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1, conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation. Item CS2, conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation and item CS3, department head performance evaluation as indicated on the posted agenda. Thank you.
Supervisor Mitchell? Uh, yes, Madam Executive or Madam Executive Officer, will you please report the uh, action taken in closed session? Thank you. The following is a report of action taken in closed session on April 6, 2021. Item CS1, no reportable action was taken. Item CS2, the board authorized County Council to initiate litigation. The defendants and the other particulars will, once the action is formally commenced, be disclosed to any persons upon inquiry. The vote of the board was unanimous with all supervisors present except for Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Executive Officer. And just to make sure I'm following all the rules, can you please uh, call roll to confirm full attendance now that we're back in open session? Thank you. Supervisor Kill. Here. Supervisor Kill, here. Supervisor Hahn. Here. Supervisor Hahn, here. Supervisor Barger. Here. Supervisor Barger, here. And Supervisor Mitchell. Here. All Thank again. you very much. You've already read the report of action. That's excellent. That concludes today's meeting. The next meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be a special closed session on Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. The next regular meeting of the Board will be held on April 20th, 2021. We stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.